like to call the meeting of Tuesday, May 11th, 2021, the hybrid regular legislative board meeting to order. And I'll ask Mr. Cohen to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is recognitions. Mr. Lytle, principal of Myers Elementary. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share about Myers Elementary. We are very excited about many of the things that are occurring in our school, uh, doing no small part to our incredible students, our outstanding staff, and our amazing parents. I'll share my screen and begin. Thank you. I will try to be as brief as possible as I know the agenda for this evening is very long, but you can only imagine as the very, very proud principal of Myers Elementary School, uh, a PBIS school receiving our state recognition for implementation of positive behavior intervention supports with fidelity for the first year uh, last year. I am very, very excited about many of the happenings that are occurring at Myers. With that being said, I would like to start off by talking a little bit about our kindergartners. Uh, they are the nearest and dearest to our heart and our school. We are so excited about what they are doing as it relates to their first school experience uh, happening in unprecedented times. But our community at Myers has really pulled together to make this a rich, warm and welcoming experience for both our in-person and remote learners. I would like to just give a huge, uh, boast of appreciation to our parents, our staff, and our teachers for their collective efforts. Here you'll see some pictures here of our kindergartners implementing uh, one of my favorite areas and one of their most excitable areas, which is science. Uh, they are here in this picture. They are working with beans um, and sprouting them into plants, diagraphing them in their journals, learning how to express uh, what they see, what they observe, and how they all work together uh, in science. Very exciting. In addition, uh, one of our time-honored projects is the hatching and nurturing of our chicks. Um, all of these things are hands-on things that students can get involved with, can learn about, can observe and see, and it, it, and it opens up the, uh, their eyes to the possibilities of thought and, and processing and analysis. Um, one of the things that I thought was very nice about this experience for our children was that we were intentional about making it something that both our in-person and remote students could engage in. So you'll see the picture on the right is one of our remote students coming in to observe the chicks that have hatched. Thanks to our teachers for staying extra after hours to just provide such an opportunity for students that were virtual to engage with the chicks um, that they've watched hatch and it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thanks to our families who were able to spend the extra time to bring those children in beyond school hours uh, to engage in that scientific discovery and that experience. Amazing job to our kindergarten teachers, uh, students, and families. We were privileged enough recently to have State Representative Napoleon Nelson visit us virtually to speak with our students about uh, what it means uh, to represent uh, a body of people in government, how our government works, and also to ask, excuse me, answer any questions that our student might have. We know that our political landscape has, is ripe with uh, almost daily with things that are occurring and our students have opinions, questions, and they wanna know uh, not just what's happening, but how they can be involved moving forward in impacting what happens in our society and in our world never too young to start to contribute or to consider how can I give back to my community and make our world a better place. We are very excited to have State Representative Napoleon Nelson give his time to answer questions for our students with the overarching idea of them dreaming big. Um, thank you, Representative Nelson, for your contribution and time to our students. Uh, it was time that is invaluable and you left an uh, 
a remarkable mark on those children as they engage with you. Thank you so much. I'm very proud of our students who engaged in the 2020-2021 Reading Olympics. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Reading Olympics, it is a very large competition in which students are assigned to read a variety of books on a variety of topics. And they work together based upon whatever story they read to engage in competitions with students from this district and other districts about a variety of questions that will be presented by the facilitators. Our students at Myers uh, consisted of fourth grade and third grade students. And even though we were one of the youngest teams to compete, we had one of the best scores. Uh, the students had a wonderful time facilitated by our coach, Coach Miss Randy Gordon, who was our school librarian. Uh, they had to read a list of over 26 books. They practiced weekly um, and they were rewarded with their for their efforts with ribbons and trophies. So kudos to our one of our youngest teams to participate for their success, their diligence and their participation in the Reading Olympics. I would also like to recognize the Myers Machines and they are our school's robotics teams. They uh, were able to win second place in the core values portion of this year's first Lego League competition. We competed in all three categories, which uh, were robotics design, core values, and innovation. And during this competition, teams were presented with a surprise task that they were not able to prepare for in advance. As they worked, the judges audited their performance as a team and how they demonstrated the core values of discovery, impact, innovation, collaboration, inclusion, and fun. And I'm very proud to say that our uh, robotics team at Myers Elementary scored second place for core values. Congratulations to them and congratulations to Mr. Osea for facilitating such a wonderful team of students. One of the new additions to the Myers uh, family this year is the Myers Student News Network. Maybe you've heard of it, it's pretty popular. It is very much the talk of the town at Myers and it consists of third and fourth grade students, students throughout our school and our parents and family. The Meyer Student News Network consists of a variety of students that talk about a variety of topics. Uh, and all of those topics are topics that are relevant to them, to our school district's mission and, and goals, and to some of the initiatives that are in our school. One of the highlights and I will be remiss if I did not say that this wonderful, wonderful Meyer Student News Network was facilitated by two of our amazing teachers. One is Miss Nancy Majenko, who holds um, place on our cultural, uh, our excuse me, curriculum instruction and um, professional development team. Uh, she is one of the leaders in our school. Uh, she's one of the leaders of our fourth grade team, as well as Miss Jasmine Hayes, who is a newer teacher to the district, uh, who has taken on several leadership roles in our building. I am most important about the relationships that they have built with our students and how they have adopted our district's missions, initiatives, and our school initiatives into the Meyer Student News Network. You'll see here that one of our biggest initiatives and parts of the Meyer Student, Student News Network is the cultural connection. And this is an amazing aspect. You'll see here pictures of students and their family members as they share um, parts of their culture as they're interviewed by Myers students. And while these are still shots, you could see the link that is at the slide here. And that link will give you access to all of our student interviews, all of our student presentations, because they are very exciting. I encourage you all to check out the Myers Student News Network by looking at uh, the website. And you can also view that website on our Myers homepage. Another important part of our Myers Student News Network facilitated by Ms. Nancy Majenko and Ms. Jasmine Hayes is teacher time. We have some of the best student reporters on this side of the Mississippi and they interview teachers, they have interviewed me, and it's all questions that they have facilitated with the help of their uh, uh, Meyer Student News Network facilitators and their parents uh, to interview teachers on a variety of topics that students find interesting and to keep this going so that our students are all in tune with one another, both remote and in person. We also have the topic of the arts, and you can see this is one of the most popular topics 
uh, just one of many popular topics where Ms. Layla Austin is here doing a tutorial for students as to how to make slime. If you don't know how to make slime, please check out this very insightful and informative video by Ms. Layla Austin, fourth grade student as to how to make slime. What's cooking? The weather, virtual voice, and of course, sports. These are just a few of the topics that you'll find on the Meyer Student News Network, which is a living, breathing, uh, updated frequently avenue for our parents and our students to engage with one another as we work together in order to promote student voice, promote some of the initiatives that are happening in our district, specifically around cultural proficiency, and to bridge the gap between home, school, virtual, and remote learners. Most importantly, we have our Random Acts of Kindness Board. This is an opportunity and a, a platform for parents, students, and teachers to display positive things that are happening in their community, in their home, a place for us all to come together to share the wonderful things that are happening in our lives in order to keep us connected to one another in this unprecedented time. With that, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present some of the great happenings that are happening at Myers Elementary School. Kudos to our kindergarten team. Thank you again to Nepo uh, State Representative Napoleon Nelson, Ms. Randy Gordon for facilitating our Reading Olympics, Mr. Jamie Osea for his wonderful work with our robotics team, Ms. Nancy Nijenko and Ms. Jasmine Hayes for the amazing work that they're doing with students, teachers, and parents as it relates to the development of the brand new Meyer Student News Network. Thank you again, and you are all welcome at any time to Myers Elementary, home of the Peace Train. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Lido. I have to, I have to say, Mr. Fishbein, that um, I may have to agree um with Mr. Lytle when he says that's the best news reporting on this side of the Mississippi. <laughs> uh, I have had the pleasure and opportunity to log on to that network and they're doing some uh, impressive work over there. So uh, I will also ask the same uh, as Mr. Lytle that if uh, the board gets an opportunity, definitely it's something that you need to, uh, to check out. Thank you, Mr. Lytle. And we'll move to the next item on our agenda, which is the student representatives report. Ms. Lamb and Mr. Rhodes. Uh, thank you. And first and foremost, before I read the agenda items, I just want to thank the board for meeting with us over the course of the year. It's truly been a pleasure for both Lisa and I working so close um, with you guys over the course of the years to make a lot of progress. Um, so thank you for that. Um, on to the agenda items. I just have some from three committees from our environmental and sustainability committee. They're currently trying to find a replacement for head of climate committee. Um, they have emailed our notes to the school board regarding input on the district's energy policy revisions and will be meeting on May 12 to discuss new steps for climate curriculum committee. From the Civics and Community Engagement Committee, they are working on the school board voter registration and are doing a $200 giveaway for a student who has registered to vote and shared one of our videos that are found on the Instagram page. They're planning next year's elections and student school board representative elections and then creating superintendent committee. And then in terms of our dance and school spirit with press secretary, they're continuing their work on their mental health Mondays, which is ending in May. So that's all from us, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to return the compliment. We've enjoyed your input into our meetings and uh, uh, we thank you for all of the hard work that you've done to make sure that we know what's going on in the student body, especially this year when you're not in school. The next item on our agenda is the acknowledgement of retirees, student representatives, and 25 year service achievement. And uh, I'll turn it over first to Dr. Lahara for acknowledgement of retirees from the high school. Take it away, Dr. Lahara. I, I knew I wasn't going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, thank you and good evening. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I, I've, um, as uh, the high school, I have the largest staff, so and I believe I have the most retirees. Um, so I will start with um, Joan Caldwell, and you know uh, I had to ask for help for a lot of these folks because, you know, unfortunately I only knew them for half a year before we went into the pandemic. Um, so uh, you know, some of them I knew personally and was able to build relationship with, and some of them, uh, you know, I needed a little help. So. We'll start with Joan Caldwell. She was a counselor at uh, CHS. Unfortunately, um, she was out on leave, so I, I didn't get to meet her uh, in person. Um, but Jan was a strong advocate for her students. Uh, she fought for them uh, consistently, and she was known to spend much time talking and listening to her kids. Uh, she was meticulous with her uh, work and was our go-to for proofreading, as uh, Ms. Lori Cohen, the counseling coordinator, states, and she had a kind heart. Uh, next. And uh, we have Dr. Ebenezer Ch uh, Chinta. He was one of our uh, 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 aides at the high school. Uh, and this is just uh, for me. I, I love walking into the classroom that Dr. Chinta was supporting um, just to see his smile, his infectious smile. Um, you know, and, and I would make it a, a point to walk into the classroom that he was supporting just to get that hello uh, and that smile. Um, he was a kind, kind hearted uh, soul. Uh, the kids really took to him um, and always surrounded him. Uh, and, and I didn't miss a beat in watching him walk the hallways to make sure that I also, you know, spoke to him. So, I'm, uh, you know, I wish him well in his retirement. Um, I hope he's getting uh, to spend time with his family. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Noreen Forkin. Uh, Noreen Forkin was also an aide, and, and she was uh, in charge of our uh, testing center. And she single-handedly uh, ran the testing center. Um, with extraordinary care and love. Uh, she served and supported her peers uh, and was always there for them to help answer any questions or concerns that they had. And to us, she was a leader among her peers and she would be very hard to replace. Uh, next, we have Ms. Ant Antonia Saunders, who was our family consumer science teacher. Uh, she also taught uh, uh, cooking, sewing, and fashion and independent living. Um, and one of the uh, uh, greatest facts about her that she was one of the initial um, contributors to our Black Scholars Program. Um, but I always love going into Ms. Saunders' class and uh, always trying to, you know, uh, mooch off whatever they were cooking for the day. Um, their mac and cheese was very famous. Um, so I always tried to go there on, a, on, on mac and cheese day. And, you know, a lot of times I would get yelled at because I would try to take the last bit that was, <laughs> that was mm -hmm. left over. Um, uh, next, we have Mr. Neil Schroeder, who is our world language uh, department chair. Um, sad to see him go. Um, I actually uh, had a tie with Mr. Schroeder because I, I worked with his wife uh, when I worked in the charter sector. And um, Mr. Schroeder was a, a sad sponsor uh, for a while. He was an assistant yearbook sponsor, longtime SAT supervisor. Um, you know, and I asked him, what are you doing after retirement? And he goes, you know, I, I really want to connect with my grandchildren more. Um, and, and now he says that his children can use him as a babysitter, um, you know, because he's going to be home much time. So just for um, him being a Spanish teacher's sake, um, Mr. Schroeder, um, if you're watching, uh, gracias por el apoyo que le has dado a todos los estudiantes de nuestra escuela. Y te vamos a extrañar mucho, pero te felicito en tu retiro y espero que See, now why did you do that? Now I think I should have paid more attention when I was in Spanish class. <laughs> hey man, just doing just doing us some justice, you know. <laughs> uh, next we have Miss Allison Shapiro, um, who uh, I asked to, to give me a little background on you know her history and, and her highlights. And one of the most memorable highlights and, and memories that she has was the uh, former principal, Mr. Joe Rogers. Uh, gave her a handwritten note inviting her into the Sheltonham school family. Um, so she says, uh, so began her 27 year career and she's had the honor of working and learning from some of the most talented educators in the profession. Uh, first, she, she was a, a classroom special education teacher and then as a challenge teacher, she's had the privilege of working with great students and their families. Uh, she was also a, cla a class sponsor and club sponsor and she is grateful for the opportunity um, to work in such a rich and inclusive, diverse, and welcoming community. And upon retirement, she will spend more time volunteering in her community. Um, two more, we have Ms. Rebecca Sheridan. 
Uh, over the course of her career, she's embraced hands-on learning and experiential, experiential learning. As the technology changed, she changed along with it. Um, examples are the use of 3D printers, uh, STEM and independent research opportunities to all the Sheltenham students. And during her time, she mentored many students and she is especially proud of the students that competed at the, as mentor in the International Science Fair. And her future plans are to spend more time with family, especially her three grandchildren, uh, travel and bike with her husband and finally volunteer. And our last retiree is Mr. Terrence Sullivan. Um, he actually started teaching in the early 2000s after leaving the education profession in the late 70s and also working in the private industry for years. Uh, through the 20 plus years that he's been here, um, he's met many colleagues, both past and present, and had the honor to call them friends. He's taught, he's taught many courses throughout the years related to the industrial arts and technology education, as well as the golf coach for several years. And his immediate plans are to live in North Wildwood, New Jersey, and travel for the winters. And he said, hopefully I would be surprised if we move to a warmer climate in the near future. My wife has preceded me in retirement and we look forward to entering the next stage of our life. I have two sons that are both well into their careers and marriages, and we are awaiting our first grandchild. So um, those are all my retirees. Congratulations. And on behalf of the Shelton family, CHS family, we will miss you very much. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lahara. Um, we will move on to Mr. Taylor for Cedarbrook Middle School. Mr. Taylor, you're up. Thank you. So I didn't have the privilege of working with Ms. Ferlito, so I asked her colleagues in the Health and Physical Education Department to share some thoughts with me. And without skipping a beat, both Mr. Rauchett and Mr. Nestor said the best word to describe Ms. Ferlito is the word perseverance. And to begin with, Ms. Ferlito drove 150 miles round trip five days a week just to teach at Cedarbrook. Having taught, having just traveled on I-95 this weekend, if that doesn't say dedication and perseverance, <laughs> nothing does. Cheltenham became her professional home and she never wanted to leave. And she was often quoted saying, getting up at 4 a.m. is no big deal when you love what you do. Mr. Rocket and Mr. Nestor observed that Ms. Ferlito was a kind and generous teacher who took the time in each class to make sure that students of all skill levels and abilities were included. Her care and attention was particularly noticed with students who had any type of physical limitation. And she made it her personal mission to purchase modified equipment so that all of our Wildcats had a positive experience in gym. Ms. Ferlito is a lifelong learner and often spent her summers discovering fun and interesting activities and ways to engage her students and she consistently reinforced the principles of sportsmanship, fair play, and kindness. As we honor her tonight, we wish her well in the next chapter of her journey. And Ms. Ferlito, if you're listening, may your days be filled with excitement as you watch your beloved New York Yankees. And if you ever get the urge for a road trip, please know that the doors of Cedarbrook are always open for you. Congratulations on your long and distinguished career and on your well-deserved retirement. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Wallace for Elkins Park Middle School. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three wonderful uh, educators who are retiring from Elkins Park. The first one is Frank DeLeo, who only spent three years with us at Sheldonham. However, was very enthusiastic and believed in children and teaching and all that he did. He worked hard to make education exciting for his sixth graders and exciting for the Elkins Park staff as well. So congratulations to Frank DeLeo. DeLeo, our second retirer was Mr. Earl Bourne. Earl Bourne can be often seen working even uh, throughout the building, keeping our technology and computers running and up to speed at the time when it was first being introduced to the Cheltenham community. He also could be uh, caught as an auxiliary person for the Cheltenham Police Department and spent a lot of times walking around the building making us laugh. Whenever he was down, he would always tell a joke. Sometimes you had to walk away to think about it, but he was always serious about being there and supporting the Elkins Park staff to make sure our technology was up and running and ready to go at all times. 
The whole police uh, showed him, police department showed up to salute him and send him wonderful sirens as he walked out, clapping him up as he walked out for his last day here in the Cheltenham community. So congratulations to Mr. Earl Bourne. And then our third retiree is Miss Jean Rauch. Jean Rauch actually taught in the Philadelphia area in Catholic schools for many years before coming over to Cheltenham. When she came over to Cheltenham, she actually taught at Cedarbrook for a while, at Myers for a while, and then she landed in the administration building where she was actually the ELA literacy supervisor for many years, at which time she returned to Elkins Park to teach as well as to be the literacy lead here at Elkins Park. She took me under her wing and helped me as a new principal learn all the liter, uh, literacy functions of the Sheldonham School District, as well as connect me with the way that Sheldonham worked as an outstanding resource, she will be missed. To all three of those outstanding retirees, thank you so much. Whether it's rain, sun, or dark, you always were there for the wonderful school of Elkins Park. So on behalf of all the community, congratulations. We wish you well in the next chapter of your lives. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Next up, Mr. Perez. Good evening, everyone. I'm proud to recognize two dedicated employees who are already enjoying their retirement. Uh, Ann Hirsch retired uh, officially in December after 23 years of service as a kindergarten aide, helping our youngest of learners in navigating their first school experiences. Uh, Anna did support both first and second in her career at one time. Uh, Ms. Hirsch did also work at the administration building a few summers. Um, in discussing some of her memorable moments, uh, Anna recalls the excitement of supporting CES during a time when the school received the Blue Ribbon Award. Uh, Anna has many beautiful memories of the children, the wonderful uh, parents, and the teachers that she had the pleasure of uh, meeting and working with. I remember Anna as a loyal and dedicated employee who worked our car line every morning and afternoon, ensuring that many of our students arrived um, and were dismissed uh, from our building safely. Uh, Mrs. Hirsch was a true professional, uh, cared for her students tremendously. Uh, Anna was a lover of cats. And I, I recall a time when one of our neighborhood uh, cats strolled onto our property and, um, and was hanging out by our school generator. Uh, she made sure that that cat had food, water, everything that it needed until uh, rescue arrived a few days later uh, to, uh, to get that cat off the property. Uh, she, uh, she is now enjoying um, babysitting her grandchild um, and has truly earned um, the rest. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hirsch, for your support uh, for so many years um, with our students at CES. Next, I'd like to recognize um, Ms. Arlita Abdul Rahim, she is officially she officially retired in January after serving 40.5 years um, at Sheltonham School District. Arlita is probably the most tenured teacher in Sheltonham at the time of her retirement. We should check that out. Check the stats on that. She may have been the most tenured teacher that we've had uh, <laughs> for our district. Uh, the majority of those years she spent working. Um, at Glenside Elementary, close to 36 years. And I have had the privilege of working with her for the past uh, three and a half years. Uh, Arlita is Sheltonham to the core. She was raised uh, in Lamont. She attended Sheltonham School District from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, it was while she attended Sheltonham High that Arlita was introduced to uh, special education as, as a high school senior. And she believed that that was God's plan for her life. And more profound that she spent most of her years working with students with emotional needs. Arlita is known simply for building relationships. Uh, Arlita would always say that it's not math or reading that will connect you with a child. It's gonna be how special you made them feel, uh, how you make them feel that they belong. Arlita will tell you that uh, we are very, we are in a very powerful, powerful position as educators, uh, that we have the power to influence other human beings and can be a positive uh, or negative influence. And we have an awesome responsibility to nurture a person that someone loves. Um, that's the legacy that she wants to be remembered. Uh, uh, our leader was featured uh, on Action News this past January as we surprised her with a 
car parade that her children planned along with um, uh, some staff uh, and Mrs. Robinson at Glenside. Many other colleagues, parents, community members participated in this event showing their appreciation of her many years of service. Um, Arlita was also recognized by the Shottenham Township Commissioners uh, and a resolution um, was given uh, for her years of service. Thank you, Arlita. We know that you won't be a stranger. She actually stopped by our building just this week. We're ex we were excited to see her. Um, and we hope that she will move forward in working with us in a volunteer capacity, continuing to support our students and community. Uh, thank you to all of our retirees. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez. Uh, so impressed with our leader Abdul Rahim's length of service and connection to our community. Kudos to all of the retirees up till now. And um, just moving on to Ms. Robinson from Glenside. I'm on mute. There you go. There Good you evening, go. everyone. Um, I have the distinct honor to say a few words on behalf of our wonderful physical education teacher, Sue Nathan. Um, Sue served at Glenside Elementary for 36 years. And what the entire Glenside community can say with certainty is that um, she represents innovation. Her colleagues would share about her famous PE learning lab, where she did a masterful job of integrating physical education with academic standards. And during this pandemic, the games and activities that she um, scholars found in their Google Classroom were literally unbelievable. The way she adapted to our virtual and hybrid learning model was simply amazing. Um, if you think about it, uh, Sue started teaching in 1985 before there were cell phones, emails, and even computers. And so um, she created, um, she crushed this teaching and learning during this hybrid model. We even last year had a virtual field day. Distinguished in her craft, I um, sought Sue Nathan out for her um, support with the safety committee and our hybrid planning committee. She holds a unique lens when it comes to patient problem solving. And um, she could also be found supporting our after school clubs. What I will never forget is Miss Nathan's famous roller skating unit. And um, my favorite part was at the end, all of the adults, we put on the skates and ride around the school until we returned the rentals. Fun times. Um, she, the next person who serves in, in those shoes will have um, some huge shoes to fill. Sue, thank you for, we wanna thank her for her time. She modeled um, excellent planning and teaching and we will miss her and hope the best for her next chapter. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Moving on to Mr. Lytle. Hello, I am extremely honored to recognize our two retirees for their outstanding years of service in the Sheltonham School District and Myers Elementary School. Miss uh, Kate Moretis, as I know her in my short tenure here in the district, was an amazing teacher. She began her career uh, teaching kindergarten and first grade. She really believed in a holistic approach to teaching, teaching the entire child. Uh, many of her past students have visited uh, her when they were in high school, in college, and they have fond memories of her classroom activities. Parents of incoming students have often requested her, even in my brief tenure, to be a part of her classroom. Ms. Moretis was one of our mindfulness ambassadors. I uh, have completed the positive psychology program at the University of Pennsylvania. She practiced mindfulness with her kindergarten students on a daily basis. Ms. Moretis is also very, very creative. She used hands-on projects and activities and those that encourage creativity um, with her, within her students. She was very much known for encouraging her students to develop a sense of independence in all aspects of themselves and in learning. She was a team player with her colleagues and advocate for students and parents alike. She served on many curricular committees during her tenure in the Sheltonham School District. And she also um, will be 
truly missed. I would like to thank her for her 28.5 years of service in the Sheltonham School District and for all of her wonderful contributions to the Myers family. Also, I would like to salute Miss Randy Gordon. She is an amazing librarian and an even more amazing person. Miss uh, Gordon will be retiring with 23 years of service in the Sheltonham School District. Well, she began her career at, Meyer, at Glenside as a librarian. And anyone that mentions Miss Gordon mentions her heart, her spirit, uh, her, collabor her willingness to collaborate, her passion for reading, and most importantly, her love for children. Miss Gordon always makes it a priority uh, to ensure that children feel happy and safe at school. She offers uh, support to families without wanting any acknowledgement or any credit for doing so. Her love for reading is evident to everyone and rubs off on the children. She knows exactly what book will spark their interest and to keep them reading. She has created a very warm and inviting library environment. She's the first one to volunteer for a home visit or for a project. And the love that she has for her students is evident every day. She will absolutely be missed. Personally, I feel that she might be one of the most generous people that I've had the privilege of meeting. She's always willing to help, to give, to share, to lead, to do, to make, to go. She is the epitome of the phrase student-centered. She is a model of kindness and uh, exemplifies love for her students each and every day that I've had the privilege of working with her. She is also awesome at making an outstanding cup of coffee, makes the best baked goods. She is a talented potter. She is dedicated to her community as she serves as the judge of elections for her precinct. She is an avid environmentalist and gardener. And she's a true environment, excuse me, a true librarian who is willing to share everything that she has uh, for the benefit of our school and our students. Uh, in the short time that I've known her, I have been delighted. Um, it has been a pleasure. Uh, she truly is the model of everything good that we have at Myers Elementary School. I would like to thank her for everything and I truly salute Ms. Randy Gordon and Ms. Kate Moretis for their years of service to Myers and the School District of Sheltonham. Mr. Lytle, thank you so much for that enthusiastic send off. Um, on to Wincote Elementary for Dr. Clark. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to join you here tonight. I actually had technical issues in my home and went riding, sprinting over to Winko, um, so I'd be able to give this presentation. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to first acknowledge um, Alex Nab. Alex Nab is the nursing coordinator for the Sheltonham School District, uh, but her home um, location is Winko Elementary. You know, I've watched Alex travel from school to school, always supporting others, always patient, always professional. This year, the unprecedented year, I've noticed Nurse Nab in action more than ever. Her expertise regarding the health and safety of our students and staff has played a pivotal role in our district's reopening for in-person learning um, earlier in February. Also, her actions and expertise in providing a schedule for COVID antigen testing that's uh, weekly testing throughout the district. Um, I know how hard she's worked to get those things done on revitalizing the nursing website in our district, um, providing the entire district with information and go-to um, suggestions regarding um, health and wellness has all happened under her direction. In the elementary school um, where she is now, you know, you get to know people more and more um, as they're here. So we spend so much time together that we get to know each other on a different level. Now, Alex started 
at Sheltonham High School. And so she was very accustomed to high school students, unlike the elementary student who really wanted a little more mothering. Um, and so, you know, she had to get accustomed to us, but you know what? She fell in love with Wincote Elementary as we fell in love with her all the same. So through the years, we've gushed with Alex over her wedding photos of her daughter, um, the pictures of her grandchildren, stories about her mother, which are hilarious, memories with her husband, her children, and so much more. So Alex, I know that you are watching and I just want you to know that you are the real deal. Um, you are a Wincoats, you are our Florence Nightingale and the Winco Elementary School family wishes you safe travels and your journeys. You know, I know you are going to travel. We want you to travel, travel, travel and send us postcards wherever you go. We'll miss you, but we know that you're, you know, we know where you, where you stay and you're not that far away. So please make sure you come back and visit, but we will miss you dearly. And we so appreciate all the years of service that you've provided to not only Wincote Elementary and Sheltonham High School, but the entire school district. And I also have, I know facilities is next, but I asked if I could share um, about another person who's next on the list, and that is Miss Della Bibbs. So Della Bibbs, come here, Dell. Della Bibbs has worked at Winco Elementary School for over a decade as our school, our evening school custodian. She takes pride in our building and lays down the law for any new custodian to make sure that they understand the Winco way, which includes cleaning all areas under her watch. But everyone at Winco considers Della so much more than just our school custodian. Her personality is infectious and you just can't help but laugh with her through the good times and the bad. Della always has a way of handling a situation and bringing life and laughter to our space. In fact, she is one of the most genuine, concerned people that I've ever met in my life. Our students love her, our teachers depend on her, and I can't imagine Wincoat without her. Della, I understand that you are at the point of your life that you just want to do you. You've mentioned that you are tired and ready. I'll miss your spotless presentations. I'll miss you always bringing me something to eat. I'll miss you having me laugh so hard that I start to cry. I'll miss your hug of concern. I'll just miss you. Congratulations, Della. Thank you. From your Wincoat family. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Clark. That was special that she happened to be there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, moving on to Mr. Teasdale, facilities. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few stuff to go through. So we're going to start with uh, Rufus Berry. Uh, Rufus uh, served most of his 27 and a half years at the Cedarbrook uh, Middle School. He also served as a district custodial foreman for several years. Uh, Rufus had extensive knowledge of the district and custodial job responsibilities and took the time to share his knowledge with the colleagues and new hires across the district. Our next staff member is uh, Mike Begley. Mike was in the maintenance department for 31 and a half years. Mike served as a building maintenance mechanic at the Cheltenham High School, Elkins Park School, and he completed his tenure again at the Cheltenham High School where he started 31 and a half years ago. Mike is also a graduate of Cheltenham High School. Mike brought a lot of knowledge and skill to the facilities department and also served as a district emergency contact. In addition to his dedication to the facilities department, Mike served in many different capacities with the high school athletic department, including head softball coach. Outside of Cheltenham, Mike serves as the head softball coach at Jefferson University. Uh, we have uh, John Husseini started his career at Cheltenham as the district roofer and painter. After several years, he transitioned to the district HVAC mechanic. As a painter, John handled some of our painting improvements throughout the district. John was given the opportunity to serve as one of our uh, HVAC mechanics. His responsibilities included monitoring our HVAC systems and conducting repairs as needed. 
Ed McMahon um, served in the district maintenance team as a district locksmith and carpenter for over 30 years. Ed was very dedicated to our department and brought extensive uh, knowledge with our lock systems. Ed knew what lock number was on any door across the district without even having to look it up. Ed retiring was a huge loss to our district, but he has happily spread his knowledge to those who took his place. Um, we have next up is Dee Jackson. Dee was a custodian at Elkins Park. Dee served her entire career at Elkins Park School. She was dedicated to providing a safe environment for our students and staff. She brought a lot of knowledge and skill to the custodial team at Elkins Park. Next up, we have Willie Mims. He was a custodian. Willie served the district at Elkins Park, Cheltenham High School and Cedarbrook for 27 and a half years. Just like Rufus, Willie had extensive knowledge of our district and custodial practices and ha happily shared his wisdom with all he worked with. He was very dedicated to his job, staff and students. Willie took the time to get to know the students in his buildings as well. Willie Williams uh, was a custodian at Elkins Park for 21 years. Willie also served his entire career at Elkins Park. Willie is a very kind and pleasant, was very kind and pleasant to work with. He always presented himself in a professional manner and was very dedicated to all the people at Elkins Park School. He was always at work and rarely called off. His positive personality and dedication was reflected in his work. Um, I'd like to thank all the retirees from the district. I obviously didn't get to spend too long with them, but we did lose 161 years of uh, service to the district. Uh, so we wish all of the retirees well uh, in their retirement. Thank you so much, Mr. Teasdale and administration. It looks like we're gonna switch up depending on who's who's retiring. Dr. Marseille, Mr. Linderman, you're first. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Custer, who um, still with us uh, supporting our transportation department, but uh, will be retiring um, at the end of August of this calendar uh, school year. Um, you know, Mr. Custer has lived in the district for over 40 years. Uh, he has two children who um, attended um, the school district and graduated from the, uh, from the high school. He has over 30 years of experience in transportation. Uh, seven and a half of those were uh, supporting and servicing Cheltenham. Um, he is extremely dedicated, hardworking, and has tremendous loyalty to, um, uh, to the district. Uh, oftentimes it is one of those uh, challenging positions uh, that uh, trying to coordinate all the transportation of all the students um, that oftentimes shift on a daily or hourly basis could be challenging, but Mr. Custer has attempted to provide uh, that service for our students. So we want to thank him and wish him and his family uh, the best as uh, in August of uh, 27, of 2021, he will um, um, say goodbye to us in transition. Thank you. Um, Ms. McManus, you on? I don't see her on, Dr. Marseille. Can you take the next one or, or Dr. Smith? Bear Urkelona. Um, I don't have the information. I don't supervise her. So okay. we have to come back to that. Okay. Sorry for that. I know yeah. Claire Urkelono if you wanted me to say something. Oh, please do. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, uh, I know Claire you know, has been in the Sheltonham School District, um, you know, longer than I've been here in the district. I know she was in special education department for years um, and then um, um, moved to more of the pupil services area um, or it might be vice versa. But, uh, you know, Claire has always been, um, always been pleasant, always um, supportive, um, always, um, uh, willing to provide information and if she doesn't have it get back to you within a um, an appropriate amount of time you know so I, I just think that she has been very thorough in her position um, and as a secretarial staff at the administration building and um, we are, are 
happy uh, for her um, upcoming retirement and we wish her well. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for stepping in without notice. Um, next, Dr. Smith. Good evening again. Dr. Cheryl Horsey embarked upon her journey at the Sheltonham School District as a contracted, contracted student service um, support counselor at Sheltonham High School. And she served in that capacity for two years, rendering individual and group counseling, assisting with student crisis management support and linking students and families to community resources. Dr. Horsley officially began her career in the Sheltonham School District in 2001, and her positions include home and school visitor, school social worker, transition coordinator, and supervisor of pupil services. Dr. Horsey has managed prevention and intervention services to support student learning and achievement and is well known as advocating for all students and all families. She is always available at any time to provide guidance and advice to fellow administrators and teachers. She is known as a kind, caring, and calm spirit who willingly supports all district stakeholders. A colleague recently stated, and I concur, she has served our community well. This school year, Dr. Cheryl Horsey served as one of the district's pandemic liaisons, providing leadership and assistance with the safe school reopening and the implementation of our health and safety plan. Dr. Horsey, wherever you are on this call, please stand and take a bow. It is well-deserved. And I want to congratulate all of our retirees that are being recognized this evening. Okay, um, I will just add one or two sentences to the Dr. Horsey tribute because this year during the pandemic, not only did she do everything that Dr. Thomas Smith just described, but she also was the point person for our testing and our vaccination efforts, which made our schools immeasurably safer for the students and faculty and staff who returned to the buildings. And that was an enormous job that she took on and, and just killed it. <laughs> Got it going so quickly um, with a ton of effort. And um, we appreciate that very much in addition to everything else that she's done for our school and our community. Um, next up, Dr. Marseille, Karen Washington. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Horsey is a class act. Um, very, very difficult to replace that, uh, the work that she has done. So thank you, along with everyone else, but uh, working with her over the last six years, phenomenal. Um, I'll defer and speak later, but I'll, I'll share uh, our, next, our next recognition um, I, I want to say that uh, Ms. Karen Washington um, retired uh, March 21st of 2021, uh, and this is after 32 and a half years of, uh, of service. Um, she, uh, when asked about her work, um, I was told that um, there's not a position she has not filled in, um, uh, in, central, uh, in, in central office. Um, uh, so she leaves us or left us uh, with a profound history of the district um, and has gained so much respect for um, all of her colleagues. So we wish uh, Ms. Washington, um, though she retired a couple months ago, we hope she's enjoying um, her relaxation uh, after 32 and a half years of spectacular service to the, to the district. Thank you. Um, next up on the agenda is the recognition of our student representatives, Dr. Marseille. Yes, thank you. So I wanna uh, take the opportunity to, um, uh, to recognize our student representatives and um, my administrative assistant uh, timed me earlier today to make sure that it was no more than a minute and 30 seconds um, as I was getting too long-winded uh, with respect to that 
Uh, so a snapshot like all of us have been doing to really capture uh, the essence of the people recognizing. I wanna start with Lisa Lamb. Um, Lisa is a true Charltonian as she began her elementary experience at Glenside Elementary. Uh, Lisa has been an outstanding and vocal leader in student government throughout her years at Cheltenham. Uh, if success is measured by the number of AP honor courses a uh, single person can take in their lifetime, uh, then Lisa has the gold medal. But we all know that though she challenges herself with her coursework, uh, that is not what defines her, but instead is her desire to help others. Hence her involvement in so many co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Um, Lisa once wrote, I believe everyone has a story of why they are who they are. And being able to understand that story is, an, is incredibly important. Uh, at such a young age, she gets the notion that the shortest distance between two people is a story. Uh, since Elkins Park, Lisa's passion for STEM has grown exponentially. Every chance she gets, she participates in STEM-related activities, um, as in to win it from uh, girls who can code, to glossy wealth development camp, to her team's first place finish at Temple University STEM leadership program. She has been a champion for so many here in Montgomery County, uh, uh, and we wish her the same, if not more, as she transitioned to St. Joseph's University's Honors College to major in science as a McNulty Scholar. Um, our next student representative is uh, Quincy Rhodes. Quincy is also a Cheltonian as he began his elementary experience um, at Cheltenham Elementary. Another social justice warrior, Quincy is unapologetic with advocating and fighting for those who are marginalized and do not have a voice. Uh, Quincy once wrote, I chose to prioritize the needs of others around me and be a voice and an advocate. I like to advocate for those who feel voiceless. Quincy has taken on personal challenges which most people would allow to consume them. However, Quincy has used this to fuel his work ethic both in and out of school. This is evident not only in the level of AP honor courses he also takes, but also the merit of co-curricular activities he is an active member. It's not enough for Quincy to participate, he needs to lead. True leaders want to be a voice for the voiceless. His role with student voices calling for immediate, short, and long-term systemic changes in schooling to the Board of School Directors, to his advocacy on police-free CSD for not only uh, police reform, but school police reform makes him the quintessential social justice warrior. Many do not know Quincy's personal journey and the roads, sorry for the pun, he has successfully traversed his grit, his never say die attitude, and his do not call it a comeback mindset is one of the many reasons why his success will continue as he will major in health and societies in a pre-health track at the University of Pennsylvania. So I wanna say personally, thank you um, to Lisa and to Quincy um, for service and being selfless and giving the time to support and represent um, your, um, your classmates. You will be missed, thank you. Moving on to acknowledgement of 25 years of service. Back to you, Dr. Lahara. All right. Uh, so uh, now I have uh, six people. So I will start with uh, Mr. Dave Burton, uh, go a little bit off of uh, off script here. Um, and I just want to shout out Mr. Burton because he is uh, Sheltonham High School. Um, I saw uh, a trend, trending post that was going on, on on Facebook and people asking if I taught your kid, um, let me know how you're doing. And the overwhelming amount of, of um, positive and just thank yous that uh, Mr. Burton received was, was really uh, heartwarming um, to see. Um, he, he started his career at Myers Elementary and then Sheltonham Elementary and then went to Elkins Park before transitioning to the high school where he's been for the past 20 years. Uh, he's received many commendations and he wants us to know that he was a girls lacrosse uh, coach from 2005 to 2013 and he, he's compiled 100 wins and he won the first and only suburban league championship in school history for girls lacrosse. So he wanted us to, uh, to know that. Um, he was also a um, 
he's been our MC for uh, Blue and Gold. So if anybody has ever witnessed Blue and Gold uh, in the gymnasium, like I did last year, um, he's an amazing MC. Um, he is a highly respected teacher in, in the school district, uh, um, a phys ed teacher, and he also teaches leadership classes uh, in our school. And I've never seen a teacher um, more enthusiastic about inviting an administrator to come visit his classroom. Um, and Mr. Burton is one of those people. So um, if you ever uh, want to be energized just by uh, conversing with somebody and having a conversation with someone, um, Mr. Burton is that person. So I congratulate you, Mr. Burton, on your 25 years of service with the Sheltonham School District. Congratulations. Um, next, we have Mr. Paul DeCipio, who is our science teacher, but he is also our science department chair. Uh, Paul has worked with uh, central administration to establish and coordinate uh, in, an engineer program within the science department. And um, uh, him and I are working together on a grant for um, our greenhouse at the high school, uh, which he converted into a hydroponics lab. Um, uh, we were able to grow some uh, romaine lettuce there last year. Um, so I'm working with a grant uh, with the Hamas Foundation um, to, to, so that we can renovate it and, and uh, really uh, get that greenhouse um, going. Um, Paul has also coached for 20 years in some combination as a girls softball coach, boys tennis coach, and girls tennis uh, coach. Um, Paul is, uh, is a pleasure to have at the high school, and I'm, I'm glad uh, he's going to stick around um, for more years to come. Paul, congratulations. Uh, next, we have Miss Lisa Fetter, who is uh, one of our math teachers, and I believe that she is one of the most um, uh, love teachers by her students um, that, that happen to be in, in her classrooms. Every time I visit her classroom uh, pre-COVID, um, students were very happy uh, to be there. Um, she's also uh, a team player. Uh, one of her colleagues mentioned that uh, there was one year where uh, nobody wanted to teach one of the high level math classes. Um, and she stepped up and, and, and volunteered and took that class and, and she's been teaching it ever since. So Thank you, Ms. Fetter, for being a team player and for being the amazing teacher um, that you are. Um, next, we have Mr. Brian Hollis. <laughs> so if Mr. Hollis is watching, the funny story. So today, um, uh, I, I sent them an email. I said, hey, Mr. Hollis, I need you to, you know, give me some highlights for you, man. Like, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm correct in what I'm saying uh, and congratulating you for your 25 years. So I saw him in the hallway and I said, hey, man, uh, you, you didn't get my... Uh, uh, um, don't leave me hanging, man. You, you, I sent you an email and he thought I was talking about the thank you email that I was sending to my teachers for teacher appreciation. <laughs> and he gave me the biggest hug in the hallway. He's like, thank you, Dr. Lahar, man. I, I appreciate your email. And I said, no, no, I'm talking about the email that I sent you last night. <laughs> so then he sent me an uh, email, but I, I appreciated the hug, man. And we're both fully vaccinated. And we had our mask on, so we we're fine. Um, but his story is unique. He said he only planned to teach for five years. Uh, when he started and then he wanted to go back to his former career, um, but fell in love with the challenges of, of teaching middle school kids because he started at Cedarbrook Middle School um, for nine years before coming to the high school. And he wanted to teach economics at, at CHS, which he's been able to do so. So um, he wants us to know that a lot has changed since he started teaching, but there's never been a dull moment. Uh, so Mr. Hollis, thank you. And Mr. Hollis is one of those teachers that you walk into his classroom and he is very excited about uh, the content that he teaches. Um, it makes you want to sit and 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 just take it all in. Um, next, we have Mr. Uh, Richard Bioto, who is one of our science teachers. Um, I, it pains me to say this, but the kids believe that he is my doppelganger, um, <laughs> and and for some reason they say that we look alike. Um, I won't tell you what I say back to the kids, but uh, you know, we, me, him and I just laugh when when the kids say that they ask if we're brothers or if we're related or he's if he, he's my long lost brother. Um, but Mr. Biota is a very exciting teacher. Um, he's always, um, you know, has a nice um, sense of humor and the kids love being in his presence. And, and I'm just glad that he's part of our team. Uh, congratulations on your 25 years, Mr. Biota, my doppelganger. And last but not least, um, and I left her for last, and Christine, I hope you're here. Um, and I didn't ask you to send me anything because I just wanted to speak from the heart about you. Um, Ms. Zubair is one of my assistant principals, but she is the glue that holds CHS together. Um, behind the scenes, she is a master at making sure that everything runs smoothly um, at the high school when, when teachers call out. Um, she, she runs the special ed department at our school. Um, you know, and I, I don't know what I would do without her. Um, she is an amazing, an amazing, amazingly hard worker 
and an e even more of a, of a friend to me. Um, I love the relationship that she has with her daughter, Emma, um, who's a, a, um, an amazing chef. She's always cooking for, for Christine. Um, and I just love to see their relationship and you know how, how they treat each other um, is one to envy. Um, and Christine, I just want to let you know that I love you very much. Um, I appreciate your friendship, um, your hard work and dedication to CHS. Um, and I'm glad that I'll be able to work with you for, you know, uh, a couple more years. So I really appreciate it. Thank you to all the, the teachers that we are celebrating tonight for the 25 years of service. Um, your work, your hard work does not go unnoticed. And I appreciate you being part of the CHS family. So thank you. That is a lot of years of service from an illustrious group. Um, thank you, Dr. Lahara. Moving on to Mr. Taylor. Thank you. The first uh, colleague I'd like to recognize is Ms. Michelle Darden. Part of the eighth grade curriculum is to study Walter Dean Meyer's story, The Treasure of Lemon Brown. The, the recurring motif in that story is that everybody has a treasure. And certainly Ms. Darden is a treasure at Cedarbrook Middle School. For a quarter of a century, Ms. Darden has led students on countless journeys with authentic literature, She's developed grammar, grammar skills and painstakingly walked countless numbers of eighth graders through the process of writing their first research paper. Ms. Mm -hmm. Darden has been instrumental in leading our faculty in courageous conversations as we wrestle with cultural competency and issues of equity and access. In 2005, as the co-sponsor of the Black Student Union, Ms. Darden took a group of students to Harlem where they rode the subway, toured historical sites, and ate at the famous Sylvia's restaurant. The image of the joy and awe on the students' faces remains permanently etched in Ms. Darden's mind and heart as one of her favorite memories. For many of us at Cedarbrook, the image of Ms. Darden's joy and awe at the birth of her first grandchild three weeks ago will remain forever in our minds. Not only do we congratulate Ms. Darden on welcoming her grandson, we thank you for developing generations of reflective readers and precise writers. You truly are Cedar Brooks treasure. Congratulations, Michelle. And the second honoree I'd like to recognize is Mr. Daniel Coons from our social studies department. And one of the joys of being the interim principal this past year at Cedar Brook has been watching these colleagues of mine deeply engage students in a specific content area. And watching Mr. Coons teach his eighth grade social studies classes has been a study in what teaching and learning should look like. This way of teaching has been Mr. Coons' pattern during his 25 years of his distinguished career at Cedarbrook. Several years ago, long before Zoom was a thing, Cedarbrook had the privilege of being one of a handful of schools nationwide to participate in a Supreme Court simulation hosted by retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and her iCivics Foundation. At the conclusion, students were allowed to ask questions of the justice. Students from other schools asked typical questions like, what was it like to be the first female justice? And Justice O'Connor politely replied. A Cedarbrook student, though, asked, in what case did you find yourself in the minority and most frustrated by the outcome? Justice O'Connor laughed and excitedly explained, my goodness, I'm going to have to give that some thought. According to Mr. Coons, she politely sidestepped the question by simply answering, although I wasn't on the court at the time, I strongly disagree with the verdict in Citizens United. Watching the 14-year-old student engage with a former Supreme Court justice in such a thoughtful way is one of Mr. Coons's fondest memories. As I think about this year, some of my fondest memories are watching Mr. Coons integrate the work of Professor Kendi's work on how to be an anti-racist in his unit on voter suppression. Last week, while doing a walkthrough, Mr. Coons was starting an introductory economics lesson on slogans and jingles. Students were asked to sing a jingle and many did, 
including Mr. Coons. And he even got me to sing a jingle too. But instead of singing jingles tonight, we sing and celebrate Mr. Coons' 25 years of thoughtful leadership as the CEA building rep for many years, his ability to engage students, not to mention his genuine kindness and his concern for the entire Cedarbrook family. Congratulations, Mr. Coons. Fabulous. Um, on to Elkins Park School, Mr. Wallace. Thank you. At Elkins Park School, we have the honor of uh, recognizing four outstanding educators for their 25 years of service. The first one, Miss Mary Aiken. Miss Mary Aiken is one of our challenge consultants at Elkins Park, where she serves students by bringing them to the opportunities of having outstanding writers, outstanding playwrights, and outstanding entrepreneurs do outstanding programs for Elkins Park over and over again. She's been dedicated to make Elkins Park the best school that she it can be by giving the students the outstanding opportunities to go on trips and experiencing things at Elkins Park that they might not otherwise. So congratulations to Miss Aiken for her 25 years of service. We then come to Miss Julie Banks, our outstanding art teacher, who has been able to do things in certain projects, including having students paint themselves, as well as today when I walked in the room and saw her painting rocks. Yes, Miss Julie Baines, you do rock. And she does everything, including bringing our very own Mr. Arthur Haywood Jr. back to dedicate a mural, which will uh, show gladly in our library and be there for a generation of Elkins Park students to come. Thank you, Miss Julie Baines. And then we are very happy to honor Ms. Therese Rothenbach, who started out in the school district in many different positions, including as one of our outstanding special education teachers. From there, she moved on to Elkins Park at some point to become a challenge consultant and team up with Ms. Aiken to bring those outstanding programs um, to our Elkins Park students. She serves and loves teaching math. She's very versatile and helps out in any space possible, including this year, teaching our fifth grade students. One thing that we love about Ms. Rothenbach is she's always willing to pitch in any grade or any subject to make sure that the students of Elkins Park receive an outstanding education. And then last but not least, as Mr. Lahara said, Elkins Park, one of our outstanding vice principals, Ms. Lynn Trimbretti. Ms. Lynn Trimbretti has worked in various roles in the school district including being a social studies teacher at the Cheltenham High School for 14 years. From then, she moved on to the uh, vice principal position at the Cheltenham High School for six years. And then she's been at Elkins Park for five years. I truly appreciate her for uh, helping me and, and guiding me as I became a new administrator to Elkins Park. I appreciate her uh, dedication. She helps us make an outstanding team of three that is there to serve Elkins Park students. Uh, Ms. Trimbetti, I appreciate you. I care for you. And I thank you for all you do for our children of, of Elkins Park. Now, all of you really deserve this. Thank you for your 25 years of service. Thank you for the light, every single spark, and all you four do for Elkins Park. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I move on to Ms. Robinson, I have a correction of the um, acknowledgement of retirees that has been brought to our attention. From Cheltenham High School, Allison Shapiro and Rebecca Sharton are both listed with 18 years of experience, when in fact, both of them had have finished serving with 28 years of experience, which is a pretty significant difference. And I'd like to make sure that when the agenda is finally posted that that's corrected. And I wanted to bring that to um, everyone's attention here on the call. And with that, I'll move on to Glenside Elementary, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. It is my honor to uh, and pleasure to honor one of our beloved and committed kindergarten aides, 
Jane Dupree, or as I call her, Miss Dupree. Um, I met Mr. Dupree at Glenside, but we later discovered that we attended the same church. And every August, we would walk down the aisle together for our pastor's honoring of educators. And I knew when we found each other that we were gonna have an awesome year. Jane, Ms. Dupree has served beside her kindergarten teacher, Sue Dunham, for 23 years. Um, Sue said that words cannot express how grateful she feels to have worked with Ms. Dupree. And she um, wants to acknowledge she has the brightest smile and the biggest heart of anyone that she knows. Ms. Dupree could be found working with our after school program. She worked in before school programs and she, it's rare for her to miss a day. Um, Ms. Dupree, we want you to know at Glenside, we love you. Your students love you. Ms. Dunham loves you. Um, and we want to congratulate you on an amazing 25 years of service at Glenside. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. And once again, I uh, congratulate all of those who have completed 25 years of service and all of the retirees. And I wish everyone a happy retirement. Um, on to the solicitor's report, Mr. Roos. Thank you. Um, executive session was held Wednesday, April 28th at 7 p.m. That was for, that was actually for acting superintendent interviews. Tuesday, May 4th executive session was a short <clears throat> few minute um, executive session for personnel matters. There was no executive session tonight and there was, yes. And the other, otherwise it's correct. Everything's correctly listed on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move to the president's report. Before we go and to the president's report, um, Mr. Fishbein, I'm getting text messages. It appears that Mrs. McManus, who was here to give recognition to Claire, is trying to get on. Um, and before we go any further, um, Ms. McManus, are you on the uh, on the call? She indicated she was having audio challenges. She's on mute. Hello? Yes, Ms. There you McCann. are, Peggy. Hi, I am so sorry. I couldn't unmute earlier. That's okay, while well, you're here, so that's a good thing. I just wanted to wish Claire Ercolano a very happy retirement. Claire served the district well for 23 years. Her first years were in the special ed department and then the last 10 have been spent with our class program. Claire has supported the program well. She's been an asset to our families and our staff and an integral part of our program. So Claire, I just wanna wish you all the best of years in your retirement, good health and good times with your family and well-deserved retirement. We wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have one request from a board member who happened to have had several of the teachers who have been recognized, Mr. Schultz. How did you know it was me? Um, I just wanted to say very briefly, um, I had Ms. Sheridan for microbiology and, and not a day goes by when I have Chinese food and do not think about um, the implications of leaving that Chinese food on the counter to cool before putting it in the refrigerator, thanks to microbiology. Um, it was a very memorable, in seriousness, I really appreciated all that she brought and her class uh, was, was legendary. Um, we would go around the school uh, trying to do a forensic analysis of who, where a, a given disease came from, uh, talking to teachers who all attended a fake party or something like that to, to see who was the culprit. Um, and then Mr. DeCipio, Paul DeCipio, who has, was recognized for 25 years of experience is also a legendary science teacher in the high school. And um, I just wanted to thank him as well um, for, for everything he taught me in AP physics. Joel, well, you're Mr. Fishbein, you may be muted. Or, <laughs> or, Ms. Haywood, oh, okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. 
Um, I, like Mr. Schultz, just wanted to acknowledge a couple of the teachers that my children had um, who are now adults and not in the world. And in particular, I just wanted to also recognize Mr. Paul DeCipio for his 25 years of service. Like Mr. Schultz, my daughter, Olivia had Mr. DeCipio and still talks about him to this day. Um, and she really, you know, gave her a lot of information about science, but really in, a lot of enthusiasm about studying science. And then Ms. Julie Baines, um, can't thank you enough, both for your 25 years of service, but more importantly, to really seeing my son as an artist early on and encouraging him. Um, and I just wanted to recognize those two individuals. And just to say in general, congratulations to all of the retirees. And thank you again for all of the um, teachers and staff that have given us 25 years of service and, and more to come. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Now, moving on to the treasurer's report. Do I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report? So move. Thank you, Chris Pender. Um, first, Pamela Henry. Second, Chris Pender. Do I have any board discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, oppo any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. The next item on the agenda is the reappointment of the board treasurer. And I'll read the resolution. The superintendent recommends that Liu Kim be reappointed as board treasurer effective July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. All in fit. Uh, do I have a, a motion? So moved. First, Mr. England, second. Second, Charles Burdell Williams. Any board discussion? Hearing none, call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, the next item on the agenda is reappointment of solicitor and assistant solicitor. I'll read that resolution. The, the Board of School Directors recommends that Kenneth Roos and Edward Diazio of the firm Whistler Perlstein LLP be reappointed as solicitor and assistant solicitor respectively for the district for the 2021-2022 fiscal year pursuant to the terms and conditions outlined in the proposal submitted to the board all rates and terms remain unchanged from those in effect for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. Do I have a motion? So, so moved, moved, Jennifer Lubin. Second, Julie Hayward. Oh. I would like to make a comment. Um, Ed, uh, Ken Roos has been serving so effect effectively and diligently for all of my years of board service and all of the years that I remember before my board service. Edward Diazio is a younger lawyer who has been working with us. Um, and recently we've had a lot of work, including in rewriting the MOU that has gotten a lot of attention. And Mr. Diazio has put his heart and soul into that effort and we, uh, I, for one, appreciate the opportunity to appoint him as the assistant solicitor. Any other board discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All sorry, Mr. Fishman, oh. I, I, I just wanted to I made, rose my hand. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't see No problem, I, I want to make, I didn't, I'm not trying to interrupt is my point. No um, I just wanted to reiterate uh, or also make a, a brief comment um, in particular, I'm very thankful for, for both Mr. Rose and Mr. Diazio's uh, experience and perspective. And I, I truly appreciate the value set that they bring to their role um, and their uh, willingness to help us think through equity issues in terms of the legal framework as we're going through it. So thank you to both of you. Thank you. Any other board discussion? 
Um, and I'm now looking at, for raised hands and I don't see any. I'll call the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Moving on, the, the next item on the agenda is the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. Mr. England, I understand you have a report. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Just a brief report. Uh, we had a uh, executive uh, committee meeting prior to the last meeting in which we were introduced to Sarah Evans Brockett as the new representative from the Perkiom and Valley School District. Uh, Jennifer Wilson was appointed to serve as the MCIU board secretary through June 30th. We had our board secretary go and get hired by Harvard and had a sudden opening. Jeffrey Sultanic Esquire, judge of ballots, reported that all constituent school districts had voted overwhelmingly to approve the MCIU 2021-2022 membership services budget which we voted on as a board several months ago. In alignment with the American Rescue Plan, the MCIU has assembled a 2021 catalog of services and in alignment with the emergency assistance to the non-public schools program. The MCIU created a 2021 catalog of services to offer support to our non-public school partners in Montgomery County. These comprehensive catalogs were shared with all Montgomery County superintendents. The MCIU had, uh, has uh, spent time over the past couple of years helping uh, with the Harrisburg School District. Harrisburg School District had been taken over by the state, uh, I believe about a decade ago. Uh, in the past two years, the uh, Secretary of Education uh, uh, ask that uh, the school be returned to the community and removed from state control. A um, uh, receiver was put in place and she hired the MCIU or she retained the MCIU uh, to help with the management plan and supervision uh, of uh, a transition to return the Harrisburg School District to the community of Harrisburg. So we had a uh, uh, a gentleman who was hired, Mr. Chris Selmer, was the interim superintendent of the Harrisburg School District. Uh, he provided us an update at the MCIU board meeting. Many of the accomplishments in all areas of finance, academics, professional development, and technology uh, since taking place, uh, since he was put in the position in 2019, have improved tremendously. Uh, at the point that MCIU became involved, there were uh, labor uh, problems, there were um, school buildings that had been neglected, and uh, students were not uh, receiving the quality education. Um, we believe that the Harrisburg School District is now in a much better place. Um, and uh, I just want to say it's, it was a pleasure to work briefly with Chris Selmer, uh, who was the interim. Uh, prior to that, he had served as interim at the Reading School District, another school district uh, that had state involvement. The MCIU board ratified the Consolidated Appropriations Act budget and narrative for the Head Start program for $135,436 in one-time funds for improvements to the Head Start program, including uh, replacing uh, mulch in several of the playgrounds with rubberized matting. Uh, the next meeting of the MCIU board will be on Wednesday, May 26 at 6.45 p.m. I also want to add that I have a document which I will share with the board. It is a one-page document that is entitled, What is an in in Intermediate Unit? And I will ask that uh, the administration uh, post this in the appropriate place on our district website. It just provides uh, a short description about MCIUs, uh, the role of the MCIU, uh, the fact that the state legislature created these in 1971, and um, the important things that the 29 intermediate units across the Commonwealth provide to public and non-public school districts. That concludes my report for MCIU. Thank you, Mr. England. Um, 
The next item on the agenda is a resolution um, supporting fair funding of public education in Pennsylvania. And um, I know that there is at least one board member who would like to speak before, well, actually, I think the order should be, um, do I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. A second, do we have First, Mr. England, second, Ms. Haywood, and now any board discussion? Uh, Mr. England, you already, um, before anyone got a chance to raise your hand, their hand, we, uh, you asked me to give you an opportunity to speak and I'm now doing that. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fishbein. Just very briefly, uh, this is uh, obviously funding for public education is uh, a major concern across the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, regularly uh, performs in 48th, 49th position out of 50 in terms of the equitable funding of public education. So there was a resolution uh, we that there had been hope that a resolution in 2016 the fair funding formula would have begun to correct uh, the funding uh, issues that we see in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, that was uh, unfortunately not the case. The uh, legislature uh, wrote the uh, legislation so that it only applied to new money that was being uh, allotted to school districts and did not touch the ter terrible inequity that we see across the Commonwealth. Uh, the growing school districts uh, receive $1.4 billion less than the fair funding formula say they should. Who does this hurt? 51% of all students are impacted by this. 78% of black students in Pennsylvania are affected by this. And 82% of Hispanic students in Pennsylvania are affected by this. This led to a case for the fair uh, school funding. Um, which states, uh, I mean, just a couple of key things here. Low wealth Pennsylvania school districts have $4,800 less to spend per pupil than wealthier school districts do. A $5,000 gap uh, that is uh, creating uh, terrible inequities in terms of the resources and the education that children are receiving in school districts uh, because of funding. Uh, across Pennsylvania, uh, according to a benchmark written into state law, school districts need $4.6 billion in additional funding to be able to give all their students a shot at reaching state academic standards. And in 277 districts, urban, suburban, and rural need more than $2,000 per student to make this um, more equitable. So in, what I wanted to say here is that um, this is something that is the way this impacts school districts across our county is that our districts that tend to be lower income and tend to have higher populations of children of color are receiving substantially less funding than better funded school districts, uh, including Cheltenham. We all know that the big concern in Cheltenham is how the formula exists here for funding public education. There was a point in time when the state contributed approximately 50% of our funding. And that has decreased to a point where it is about 20% of our funding currently. Um, that's a 30% shift of funding of education to local property holders. And I mentioned that because that is how we see the impact of this in our community. So there is a lawsuit that is proceeding this September and I uh, brought forward this resolution and have asked the board to consider uh, passing this. This is just uh, saying that, um, you know, we're in agreement that the state has an equity problem in its funding and uh, we are supportive of resolution of this. Thank you, Mr. Fishbone. Thank you, Mr. England. Is there any other board comment? Ms. Lohman, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I just want to say that um, I wholeheartedly support this resolution as one of the previous legal advocates who 
was working on some of these fair funding lawsuits. Um, advocates for public school students have been attempting to um, reform the way the state funds its public education system for the past 45 years. And we feel like we finally, there's finally a good shot, um, hopefully at making that happen um, starting this September. But the pressure needs to still be brought to bear on our legislature um, to ensure that the way that our system of um, public school funding is op operates does actually change for the better and is more equitable. Um, and there's still a long road ahead of us, but I appreciate that Mr. England um, brought this resolution in front of the board and the only way we're ever going to truly achieve equity in terms of public education funding in this state is to dramatically change the way that the amount in which our state funds our public schools and the way in which that funding flows to our public schools. So um, we have a long way to go, but I am hopeful that change may actually be on the horizon this time. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Ms. Haywood, I see your hand is raised. Um, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I wanted to first thank my um, board colleague, Mr. England, for bringing this resolution to the board's attention um, for review this evening and also for eloquently providing background as it relates to the fair funding litigation in Pennsylvania. Again, it's unfortunate that litigation had to be brought to bear in order to have a more serious look at fair funding in Pennsylvania. But really, when you look at the inequities in terms of funding public education, as it relates to varying school districts, I think Mr. England provided those um, data points for us. And if you really look at the per pupil spending um, for education in various school districts, there's a wide disparity. Um, and I think that this goes a long way to basically indicate to the governor and to our elected officials that the Cheltenham School District is in full support of fairly funding public education. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haywood. I see no other hands raised, so I'll call the question. All in favor of adopting this resolution, say aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. say nay. Hearing none, this motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. England, for bringing it to our attention and for your eloquent words of support in favor of it. I'm happy to be able to report out that this board unanimously approves this resolution. Um, next on the agenda is the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology, Mr. Burdell Williams. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology Joint Operating Committee had its regular meeting on April 14th, 2021. Um, under the president's report, there was a review of items including instruction at Eastern, uh, minutes from the Eastern Foundation, and also information about a fundraiser. The most important aspect about the president's report, however, was a presentation on the Skills USA district competitions. Uh, that were held back in February virtually um, about the Skills USA uh, competition and the program itself. Um, Skills USA is a national student organization that develops employability, participatory, and leadership skills to complement the occupational skills developed by students in technical education classrooms or work based learning sites. Skills USA is an integral part of approved technical education occupation programs. I share that also as a preface to recognize the Cheltenham students who participated and also achieved uh, great honors at this year's uh, Eastern, uh, sorry, at this year's uh, Skills USA competition. First, Miss um, Kayla Marshall uh, was a first place winner who will compete in the national competition held virtually in June. Uh, we had uh, Lillian Trump from Cheltenham, who was a second place winner in the cosmetology program, and also Kashmir Amara Moore, who was a third place winner in the Allied Health program. Um, we were one of two school districts to have uh, individuals who placed in all three 
uh, first, second, and third place uh, categories. And I'm very grateful for the efforts of the, the students themselves to go as far as to compete and put themselves and the support of their teachers and, 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 school, and school community on their backs. And, um, and honestly, really, really move um, their not only school careers, but uh, adult and work careers uh, in a positive direction. Um, moving on, the Joint Operating Committee approved all of our financial reports and disbursements, uh, and also then acknowledged Miss Jessica Derricks, a senior at Abington Senior High School, as the Student of the Month for April. Uh, just something really brief about Jessica. Uh, she currently works, sorry, at Abington Senior High School. Jessica is a member of the marching band, indoor color guard, reading Olympics, and a member of the National Honor Society. She also volunteers for the Abington Library's Abington, Reed, Abington Reads program. Jessica currently works at a salon as a shampoo assistant. Uh, after graduating and receiving her cosmetology license, which she's very close to, to receiving, um, she'd like to continue working at the salon and also continue uh, her post-secondary business courses at Montgomery County Community College. Um, inspired by her experience at Eastern, um, she'd like to open her own salon and also even become a cosmetology instructor. Uh, moving on, the uh, Eastern Center, we heard a little bit more about um, a very, I'd say, uh, one of the most important presentations that has been presented in my time on the Joint Operating Committee uh, regarding social emotional, social emotional wellness and the efforts of Ms. Larson, who is the Supervisor of Career and Technical Education, um, who shared with us some information regarding the responsibilities of her positions regarding student management, special education, school safety, and enrollment, but most specifically um, presented her findings and shared um, Eastern's progress for implementing responsibility-based discipline. Very, very, very enlightening presentation. Um, again, very reflective of the efforts that Eastern is taking to continue to in, implement more social emotional learning um, into their curriculum, uh, really to align with that of the other schools from the sending districts as well. Uh, moving on, under uh, academic affairs, the Joint Operating Committee uh, heard minutes from the Administrative Advisory Committee, uh, also received an update about the antigen testing uh, for, for um, senior cosmetology program students um, in order to uh, really facilitate their ability to get into um, get, get into um, so the cosmetology environment to be able to actually go into salons uh, and clinics to be able to gain the skills necessary to, to achieve their state license. Uh, additionally, uh, and under the policy, uh, under policy updates, the Joint Operating Committee uh, received information regarding an update to a director's procedure and also uh, approved waiving the adult cosmetology fee for students graduating in 2021 for up to 100 hours per student. Um, it takes, I believe, close to 1,500 or 1,250 hours to achieve their license, but given the uh, challenges with employment and also finances for families, um, the Joint Operating Committee, under the recommendation of the administration, believe that um, at least 100 hours of that could be waived in order to really allow students to start down a path to achieving their cosmetology, their cosmetology certifications. Um, additionally, the, uh, the Under Personnel Affairs, the Joint Operating Committee um, approved a series of leaves um, as well as um, special opportunities as training supervisors. Um, moving on uh, under facilities and financial affairs, we did receive the building report, which for the first time in a very long time did not include any information about the roof uh, because that project after almost, I believe three years of two years of planning and a year or more of actual project ex execution and quite a few change orders over the last six months has finally been completed. Um, lastly, under facilities and financial affairs, the committee approved um, intent to award uh, some interior reno renovations to three contractors 
a general contractor, one in electrician, uh, an electrician contractor, as well as an HVAC contractor. Addition, in addition, we approve the physician of record, uh, who I would share at some point in time, but I don't have that information in front of me right now. Uh, and lastly, continued, uh, actually started and entered into a lease for the Montgomery County Board of Elections to utilize Eastern um, as a voting site coming up for the May, uh, the May elections being held on May 18th, 2021. The next meeting of the Eastern Center for Arts and Technology Joint Operating Committee is tomorrow, and it will be held via Zoom at 8 p.m. The link to the meeting can be found on Eastern's website at eastech.org, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Burdell Williams. Um, next is the superintendent's report, Dr. Marseille. I timed you, Mr. Charles Burdell Williams. Okay. On your mark, on your mark, get set, go. Let's see how that works. That was what, fast. What, was what fast. did the top, what did the stopwatch say? I had him at seven minutes, 47 seconds, point okay. six seven tenths. <laughs> Faster than Wagner Marseille. We'll hold you accountable. Um, so I too have a, a short report, just a couple of, of highlights, if I may, um, I want to share my, uh, my screen. Um, um, so I want to, um, on the heels of uh, the celebration of uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, and uh, I, I want to thank and, uh, all of our, our, our teachers for the work that they've done, they continue to do, especially during this uh, pan, uh, pandemic. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to all of the parents, the PTOs, our community partners for coming together and showering our, our staff with wonderful thank yous and our, and our students, um, you know, the building were vibrant uh, throughout that week. And I, I, I challenge everyone that we don't have to wait till um, next calendar year, May, um, uh, to bring such recognition. But we do wanna thank them and especially our, our parent groups who did such a phenomenal job um, in supporting our, um, our, our teachers and our principals who were part of the celebration, who led so many uh, wonderful programs to acknowledge that the messages from our, our, our students, uh, so thank you. Um, I have this up here because we always have this up here, um, our mission invasion statement. Today um, uh, in our monthly meeting, a superintendent's council, which is made up of all of our uh, um, central office building level administrators, uh, Dr. Barbara Moore Williams was part of our uh, conversation today as we talked about uh, cultural proficiency, equity and anti-racism, uh, our look at our goals, that we've been working on under our six pillars uh, and then our efforts to continue that work uh, moving, uh, moving forward. And obviously, you know, the trepidation of transition and not skipping a beat. But one of the things that I'd like to um, share with the board and put out there as a recommendation is that in our conversation, um, there was, um, uh, uh, we spoke specifically about uh, our core work, cultural proficiency, equity, anti-racism, and wondering when um, the board moves forward with strategic planning 2.0, it is paramount that in that analysis, we have to revisit our mission and vision statement. Um, and is it paramount for us to name it within those statements and to be very deliberate and intentional with making sure that we have um, terms like equity, cultural proficiency, um, and anti-racism bedded in our mission and vision statement. And I uh, call you and challenge you to think about that. Uh, and um, we have a large group of Kaidre members, just in case you forget, which I don't believe you will, they will bring that up to, uh, to administration. Uh, we'll remind everyone with respect to um, uh, kindergarten registration that opened last week. And uh, obviously 
uh, the Office of Student Services, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Gray and others are willing to support our families as they go through that process and visit our website. Uh, and please contact us um, with any questions, uh, comments, concerns that you have. Uh, we wanna make this um, as seamless as we possibly can, do better than we've done before. So it's important that uh, if uh, you have questions uh, or comments uh, to please reach out, um, uh, reach out to us. Um, the next conversation, I, I wanna quickly remind everyone that I sent communication out last week with regards to Governor Wolf's and the Joint Task Force um, announcement that they are going to lift on May 31st, um, a significant number of uh, the mandates that were put into place as a result of COVID-19. And since then, people, there's been a number of conversations, still unanswered questions with regards to next steps. Um, we do know that um, uh, the challenge is that if we really would love to get 70% um, uh, of Pennsylvanians um, fully vaccinated, we're somewhere around the 52, 52%. Um, 52%. Um, but vaccination is indeed um, uh, one of the ways to get us there significantly faster. Uh, and um, we encourage our families who um, are thinking about vaccination, who want more information about that to please visit Montgomery County's website or our website uh, that um, our offices, the Office of Curriculum is consistently updating with this, uh, uh, the support of other departments as, uh, as, as well. Uh, and talking about uh, departments, we wanna reiterate our partnership um, with um, our wellness pharmacy and the work that they've been doing with us in terms of providing uh, um, vaccination for our students or those 16 and, and older. And you recall, we shared um, uh, that with you. And then our second dose for those who had registered is May 20, uh, May 21st. Um, uh, so please make sure that um, you hold on to that date. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing is that uh, there's alarming, alarming number of individuals who took that first dose and who are not coming back for the, the second dose. So that's extremely important uh, that we follow up with that second dose. With that, uh, the announcement um, of uh, PA residents 12 and older who are eligible for the uh, Pfizer vaccine, uh, another window has opened in terms of providing that for those families. Uh, we are excited uh, to announce um, that um, um, with our team um, that is made up with Dr. Horsey, Ms. Jackson, um, Ms. Dunlap, Ms. Uh, Alex Nab, who is being recognized for her um, retirement, who's been instrumental um, in helping us as part of our pandemic team and coordinating all of these efforts that um, our partners um, have uh, reached out to us and they do wanna offer an opportunity for our students 12 to 15 to get vaccinated. Um, uh, our offices are working on what that schedule could look like and wanna put that information out as quickly as, uh, as possible. Uh, in the meantime, uh, um, Montgomery County has shared information with regards to uh, where you can get vaccinated for everyone ages 12 um, or, uh, or order, older, so please, um, uh, that's this will be posted on our website as well. So as we are working to schedule something uh, on site uh, on our property, uh, there are other opportunities um, for families to to exercise. And we encourage you to explore, read, review, and talk to your families um, with regards to uh, with regards to vaccination. And then lastly, um, just want to um, as you as always remind you of upcoming meetings. Uh, moving forward uh, and your participation uh, is, is welcome. Your questions are welcome. Your input uh, is welcome uh, throughout this process as we are uh, approaching uh, the bell lap here for the end of the school year. And uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Frischbein. Okay, who timed him? Thank you for your report, I'm only 
kidding around. Um, Seven minutes, 45 seconds. <laughs> well done, sir. Um, That's unofficial. The next, uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the April 13th, 2021 legislative board meeting. Um, do I have a motion? So move, Jennifer Lohman. Do I have a second? Second, Julie Haywood. Um, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Moving on to public comments on agenda items only. And um, I do want to emphasize that this period of the meeting is only for comments on agenda items. And um, I know that there are people in attendance who wish to speak on the issue of Coach Nace. Um, that is not on our agenda, so there is a second time for you to speak then at the end of the meeting. Also, the MOU is not on the agenda, so comments about that will have to wait to the second comment period. And um, comments are to be done in accordance with the procedure that is on the screen, so that if you are here, um, I'll ask you to Actually, are we having people raise their hand and then turn on their mic? Is that how we're doing it? Technical people? Or Ken? As far as I know, I don't know if, um, I'm not sure. Ah, yes, Mr. Okay. Kaufman. Okay, so Mr. Kaufman has, has said that if you, um, if you raise your hand, um, we will, uh, Mr. Kaufman will will turn you will permit you to speak in the meeting, and that is the only way we'll take comments from people in attendance on the Zoom. And as far as people who are watching the live stream, you and only you can email your questions or comments to CSD Board Meeting Commit Comments at Cheltenham.org. And we will either read or summarize those, but we will include them with the minutes if, if we don't read them in their entirety. Mr. Roos, have I gotten anything wrong procedurally or illegally? Not at all. Nope, exactly correct. Okay. So I will, um, I will go to the participants and call on people who have raised their hands. I do not see any raised hands. That's, that's correct. That's okay. And um, is somebody monitoring the email see if there are any emailed questions we are but um as you recall there are some that come afterwards so we're going to have to continually kind of do that so i don't know how the board wants to approve that process um, but there are some so individuals who come if, a if, little bit late if we get ones that are late what i would suggest and mr roos you can tell me if this works is we can um, we can publish them with the minutes so that they're in the record and answer any questions that are included in those emails at the next public meeting. Correct. There is there's only there is only one comment in there and it's from this morning. Okay. It's not on an agenda item. Okay. Very good. We will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is committee reports. Um, Mr. Schultz, Financial Affairs. Thank you. The Finance Committee met on Tuesday, May 4th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. 
following roll call and approval of minutes, the first agenda item was an update on the 2020-2021 budget, which is the current year. This fiscal year has not ended, but revenues from local sources are approximately are, are already approximately two hundred thousand dollars higher than budgeted, and this is primarily due to rec uh, recent impact of positive assessment appeals for the district and township on commercial properties. Revenues from federal sources is significantly higher than budgeted due to COVID relief funds um, to the tune of seven hundred thousand. And the district has currently collected approximately 54% of the total budgeted state revenues as of April 30th of this year. The next topic was an overview of expenditure reductions, which are um, related to and incorporated in the 2021-2022 budget year. That's next year. These include uh, expender, expenditure reductions totaling $1.95 um, and to be a little more specific, around 200,000 of that is offset revenues through use of COVID relief funds, ESSER funds um, for late buses, $175,000 in attritional savings in the facilities department, uh, $370,000 in attritional savings in teaching and staff estimated. And for those who don't know, attritional savings are savings realized when an employee has resigned or retired and their position is not going to be filled. So it's not, um, it's not removing an employee from the district, but simply um, leveraging, uh, leveraging a, an open position to find efficiencies in operations. $300,000 in savings due to potential outsourcing of the CLASP program, which was discussed at the previous legislative um, meeting, $800,000 in healthcare and life insurance premium reductions, and $100,000 in Eastern tech tuition reductions. So again, those, all of those reductions total approximately $1.95 million, um, which, is, which is notable and a positive thing for this district and community. There are budgeted expenditure increases as well, um, some of them are out of our control, uh, some of them, or both of them are out of our control, um, some of them are not even planned, and in particular, the charter school costs in our district have increased by approximately $1.8 million since the onset of COVID. Um, this is something that, that the district has been discussing uh, addressing. Um, we have some positive signs around, hopefully reducing that number next year due to proactive uh, outreach by members of administration to essentially ask families to come back now that now that our virtual learning and hybrid learning programs are a little bit more tried and true, uh, well, a lot more tried and true, and uh, seeing a lot of success and positive outcomes. So wanted to highlight that because if you are on this call and you are uh, in a charter school, please consider returning to Cheltenham uh, School District. The debt service has increased as well from, from, uh, from last year from a budget perspective by approximately $1.5 million. And that's a reflection of, of various things as, as we have as a board and administration attempted to smooth, smooth increases um, and smooth over our use of, um, of our fund balance. Those two things combined are around $3.2 million of expenditure increases. So for those doing the math, that, that is a net uh, increase in expenses, but I separate them because they're worth, worth understanding in isolation. Administration then provided the board with a, proposed, uh, a proposal for a debt restructuring, which we will be voting on tonight. Um, this proposal would take approximately $3.5 million of debt service payments scheduled for this year and next year. That's, that's a portion of the debt service payments and move them to 2042, which would allow the district to avoid um, any use of fund balance in this year's budget and likely next year's budget. Um, this restructuring would address the short-term jump in charter school costs uh, uh, and would cost the district $3.27 million in additional debt service payments spread over 20 years. So that's a bit complicated to understand. I imagine we will be discussing it more as part of the vote, um, but the idea is essentially 
short-term uh, short -term decrease in debt service, and the trade-off is long-term um, slight increase over time, um, resulting in a total of $3.27 million that, of additional cost in total over that time. There will be a voting item on this this evening. The next topic was an overview of budgeted revenue increases. Um, and outside of tax increases, the budgeted revenues reflected uh, $1.5 million of increased tax base due to the impact of assessment appeals. I want to underscore this. This is, a, this is from my perspective as, as one board member and a co-chair of the Finance Committee, a huge deal. Um, these are the kinds of things that, that help our district become more sustainable. This is recurring revenues that are, are um, not the result of a tax increase. These are recurring revenues that are the result of um, assessment of the value of, of commercial properties in our, in our township. Um, there are smaller, smaller changes as well, such as a reduction um, in invest, small reduction in investment revenues um, of the result of the pandemic, an increase in earned income tax revenues. Again, that is not to say an increase in the tax, just an increase in the revenues, which means more Cheltenham residents are, are overall earning more money. Um, the proposed budget also recommends an Act 1 increase of 3%, which would generate $2.5 million of additional revenues. And currently, the state budget for education has not been finalized, so this budget is, um, is being budgeted with an assumption of flat funding from the state. The proposed final budget in total being voted on, the proposed final budget being voted on tonight, which is not the same as the final budget, uh, reflects a deficit of $465,699. Uh, um, or I should say the proposed budget presented at the financial affairs meeting. Um, that is the highlights of our meeting. The next meeting is in, I apologize for failing to include this in my notes. Um, I believe it is June 8th or June 1st, June 1st, the night of June 1st um, after the facilities committee meeting. That concludes my report, but I do have some action items. Unless there are any corrections or board comments. Yeah, I. Report. I have a comment. Please, Mr. Fishbein. I, have, I will call myself now that I've raised my hand. Um, the, the deficit of 450,000 plus is before any refin the refinancing that you discussed. And if we were to do the refinancing, there would not be a deficit. We would have a surplus. And I just wanted to make sure that the public understood that um, and not commenting on the pros or cons of the of the refinancing just that that would have that effect ms haywood um yes i also just wanted to add and mr schultz you may have said this i'm not sure that this final proposed budget also does not include a requirement to use any of our fund balance which is significant um, we have used our fund balance for the last several years, part portions of our fund balance for the last several years, which has depleted that, um, you know, th that bucket of money that honestly we should not be using for recurring expenditures. So I'm pleased that this final proposed budget does not include having to use any of our fund balance to make up those um, those gaps. Well, that, I would, um, if I may, offer a a, a a minor correction because I. Um, and folks should correct me if I'm my correction is wrong, but okay. the proposed final budget does reflect a deficit uh, uh, that as presented, which which would translate to a use of fund balance, a budget in order to balance the budget of four hundred and seventy thousand dollars or so. But, uh, but would not unless have, the debt right. restructuring occurs. Correct. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Any All other right. board comments on the presentation? 
All right. Um, and seeing seeing none, uh, I will read these uh, these items. The first is uh, item one: adoption of parameters resolution for debt restructuring, 2021, 2022, and for the refinancing of debt in October. Um, and is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Charles Burdell Williams. Thank you. Um, and I believe we have, would have a period of board comment first. Correct. So is there any board comment? Mr. Cohen? Yes, thank you. Um, just asking for clarification and also, um, I'll phrase it this way, correct me if I'm wrong, but just to be clear in my mind, this is for parameters to move forward and move towards um, offering um, refinancing the debt, but not to actually refinance the debt itself. And that would, I believe, require a separate vote of the board in the future. I'm not against pursuing this, but I just want to make clear for myself and also for the community that there are two separate elements. This is to look at and to move forward on refinancing the debt, but I believe it would require a second vote at a future meeting to actually um, refinance that debt going forward. Is that correct? Yes, I, de I defer to Mr. Ruse. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, this is exploratory because we don't have terms and conditions to vote on yet. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other board comment? Um, I have I have one comment, and since this is exploratory, I'm not sure if this is a premature comment. Um, but since I assume there are costs associated with exploring, I would like to, to, voice, um, to voice it anyway. Uh, and that is simply the conversation that, from my perspective, the conversation that led to um, the exploration of this debt refinancing was when a, a much earlier version of the budget was presented with a much larger um, structural deficit on the table. Uh, I am incredibly impressed with, with the work administration has done uh, to bring our structural deficit down significantly, even in light of the increases to charter school costs in particular. Uh, and with that in mind, I am, I am not personally in support of the idea of taking out functionally a, a $3.5 million short-term loan to avoid use of fund balance when that results in um, $150,000 of increased, save, uh, increased spending over the next 20 years. So in other words, the idea of avoiding 400, a $450,000 spend this year, in, but in a way that requires us to spend $150,000 a year for 20, feels, um, doesn't feel worth it to me personally. And I wanted to voice that. Um, during this deliberation, this, this deliberative period. Uh, that's my comment, but uh, Mr. Cohen, sorry, I forgot I'm chairing this portion. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. And I just want to raise two points. One is to reiterate the point that Mr. Schultz made that we had meaningfully increased costs for charter schools that we did not budget. And the hope and assumption going forward through good work of the administration is that we'll attract a good number of those families back to the school district to provide them with good education and also to save costs. The charter school costs are meaningful and impactful for the school district. It's much more conversation we'll go into. And it's a systematic issue um, with the state, but the cost the school district incurs for charter schools is problematic um, for each student that goes out because of the way it's, um, it's done in Harrisburg in terms of regulations and laws, and also for the school district for the budget. And again, I do hope that we can attract a meaningful number of the students and their families back to the school district in terms of providing very good education. The second is just to dissuade and remind people that there was not any huge great cost savings because of the pandemic. I have a sense that there's speculation or belief um, that logically seems correct, but it's unfounded in actuality where the school district saved a lot of money in many different areas because of the pandemic. And in the aggregate, that is actually not true. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Ms. Henry, I see your hand is raised. 
Yeah, I just wanted to um, make note that <clears throat> with the vote tonight to continue to uh, basically explore and look at this as um, an option to cover the, the debt that we're incurring at $450. Um, I still think it is um, prudent for the board to consider other options um, for our debt and to consider looking, you know, at attrition in other ways that we can bring our, our cost um, into the, the, the place that they need to be. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Is there any other board comment? I have, I have one just procedural clarifying question um, regarding this vote. This vote does not, I know, forgive me for the repetition, this vote does not prescribe that the, that the restructuring occur. It's an, explorate, an exploratory vote. Um, does, does it have any ramifications in terms of budgeting process over the next 30 days or, um, or any other ramifications outside of simply being exploratory? Um, I don't believe it does, but I'll defer that to, to uh, Mr. Shaw and Mr. Linderman. Sure. Uh, I'll answer that. Um, the, the, uh, there is, there's no cost involved to do this. And Mr. Roos knows that the, you know, there's no cost involved in, in borrowing other than you know, uh, Mr. Schott and my time uh, to get, get things ready. The, the cost incurs when you, when you actually uh, pass the bond resolutions. But um, the, only, the only thing is we need to know if, if you don't do this, then you, you are committing yourself to definitely a 3% tax increase and the need to cut another almost $500,000, which the only place we have left to go right now is is additional staffing and uh, you know so that's going to have to be thrown on the backs of the principals and, and we'll have to reduce staffing further through that 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 won't happen mr linderman just i'm just saying it's the only place i'm just a math man i just it's well, i'm it's saying it, the me. board would have to authorize the use of fund balance yeah yeah and can't, then you're then I, can't, I can't find that money in staffing i know that we dr lahada is working to provide update information but um, if that indeed were to take place, that would have a significant impact on courses that could be offered. Um, and we are not willing to move in that direction. So it would have to come from someplace else. And that would mean that the authorization of the use of fund balance in order to do that, right? Um, we need the biology teacher. <laughs> um, we also need the librarian. Um, and uh, I could not, as much as I try to stretch it, can make an argument for that level of attritional savings in addition to some of the areas we've already garnered. Um, so with that, um, it would have to come from um, uh, fund, uh, fund balance. Okay, thank you. That, that answers my question. And, and obviously the, the deeper conversation I think can happen in, in committee um, and, and going forward. So uh, Mr. England, I, I didn't mean to cut anybody off, but Mr. England, I see your hand. Thank you. I just want to be very clear <clears throat> about this. We're talking about a couple of different interrelated things. This is to give authority to go shopping, essentially. Look for some money to borrow at a good rate. That's what this authorization is for. Uh, this relates, however, directly to a budget that we're about to vote on. We're about to vote on the final proposed budget, and we'll have a vote on the final adopt. We'll adopt the budget in June that may or may not be very different than what we're looking at tonight. I just want to make certain that we're clear, that I'm clear what we're doing. So we are going to vote on a process, which seems harmless enough. Um, although your point is well taken, Mr. Schultz. We're then going to vote on a final proposed budget. And the question is, how are we balancing that? Is this, uh, we are looking at fund balance uh, with the potential to change that in October, months after the budget has to be uh, passed. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces there. I wanna be very clear what we're voting on. 
Mr. Uh, Mr. England, I believe that your analysis is correct, that we are voting on a approval to go shopping. Um, and with regards to uh, how the budget is balanced, uh, Mr. Fishbein, your hand is raised. I don't know if you're responding to Mr. England, in which case I will defer to you. Well, I will. I don't. I, my hand was raised to add to the conversation. Your okay. response to Mr. England is okay. Welcome. Then I then I will let. let um, does that answer your question, Mr. England, or were you looking for a specific answer around how the budget would be balanced as proposed in the final proposed budget? So the proposed budget that we're going to vote on is using some some amount of fund balance at this point in time to create a balance on both sides of the ledger. Um, Indeed, that is my understanding. So yes, I believe what you have conveyed is accurate. Um, and if if it, if I if that is incorrect, I would ask administration to correct. Okay, uh, Mr. Fishbein. Um, yeah, just to add one voice to the conversation about the borrowing, the way I look at this loan is it is to fund the time when we have excess charter school enrollment that is above the norm. If we were to borrow the money, we would hope that in the two years that we're using that money to reduce our debt service, we would then get our charter school costs back in line. And what we, the way I look at it is, it's as if we are paying interest on the loan at $150,000 a year and paying it off in year 22 or 21 when we currently don't have any debt on our books for that year. And it um, would eliminate the need to further go into our fund balance to risk having to go into fund balance next year because of excess charter costs. And right now we're not even voting on whether we're doing that what we're voting on now is whether to explore that. So that's, Thank I you, just Mr. wanted to add that to the conversation. Yes. Any other board comments? Then um, I will, I think we can move to the vote. And I, if, if okay, I would like to go by, by voice. I, I'll, I'll read, read down names. Um, Mr. Fishbein? Aye. Ms. Lohman? Nay. Mr. Burdell Williams? Nay. Ms. Haywood? Aye. Mr. Cohen? Aye. Mr. England? Aye. Ms. Henry? Um, aye. Aye. Um, Oh, Mr. Pender. Uh, maybe Mr. Pender. I think has... he had to drop. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. Sorry, I, I I don't have gallery view up, so I can't see all the names. Um, so I believe I've called everyone, um, and I am nay, and I in that confusion lost track of the vote. I think that made it six to two. Yeah. Five eight, five eyes, three nays. Oh, three Thank nays. you. Right. All right. Uh, and that moves forward. And the second item is approval of the 2021 2022 final proposed budget. Um, Mr. Roos, do I need to read this or can, can I say as listed? You can simply say the result, the budget, the approval of the uh, 2021-22 final proposed budget resolution as set forth in the agenda. Uh, then this vote would be for, I need a motion for the approval of the 2021-2022 final proposed budget as set forth in the resolution. Uh, first, um, Mr. Mr. Fishbein. Yep. Second. second, Charles Burdell Williams. Mr. Burdell Williams, second. Uh, is there any board discussion? I, oh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Um, not wanting to be difficult or cause trouble, but the way the resolution reads now is it says that the budget will be adopted at a public meeting um, on June 17th, to paraphrase. 
and I'm not anticipating any problems or any, any situation that does not happen, but it seems to state affirmatively the budget will be adopted where the budget will be voted upon that evening. And the way it's worded now, um, I am a little bit troubled semantically in that such will be adopted or as, as a foregone conclusion. So I'm just requesting that the language be possibly altered to will be voted upon at a public meeting or something along those lines. Thank you. Let, let me suggest in a minute, just to simply state when the budget will be presented for adoption at a public meeting of the Board of School Directors. All right, thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Um, Dr. Marseille, I don't know if I heard you. Was this no, I, I thought by law the board has to adopt the budget, but I can understand the uh, request for the change in the language. But come that date, um, right. <laughs> rain or shine, um, the board's one of the board's major responsibilities is to ensure that that budget is passed. And, and if I can just jump in, I'm, not, I'm certainly not disagreeing with that point. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I understand the clarification now. Yeah, I think to be clear, that that's on. 30th. so you know, if 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 some reason happens for some reason the June seventeenth meeting couldn't be held that night, it could still. I mean, you have until June thirtieth to adopt a budget. Right. Understood. Thank thank you all. Um, the the Mr. Fishbein and Mr. Burdell Williams, since you first and seconded the motion, would you be amenable to the amendment? I am. Yes. All right, then we don't need to amend it. Um, so that the motion has been updated. Is there any other board comment? Seeing none, um, I will do this by acclamation. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. And that concludes my uh, report. Thank you all. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the Ed Affairs, Ms. Henry. My report will be um, <clears throat> the Ed Affairs meeting was scheduled um, for, I believe it was uh, April 20th, but uh, we scheduled it on October May 5th. Um, Dr. Brian Riley, who's the director of STEM, and Matthew Pimental who is a supervisor of professional learning for grades K through 12 um, and gifted ed, provided an update um, on several items. The agenda included um, comp and science, a STEM update, pathway um, development, a project-based uh, learning update, um, and also a showcase. Um, I'd like to say that in spite of the brevity of um, my report, that um, the update that was provided was very comprehensive um, and it, it wouldn't do it any justice for me to try to go into a lot of detail about it because you really do um, need to go in and look at the slides and review the information there to really get an understanding um, of, those, um, of the information that was provided to us. But there were a few highlights that I'd like to um, call out. Um, one highlight is that the, we were granted in January um, 2020 a PA SMART grant um, for the science program, um, STEM. And also uh, project-based learning. Their um, uh, Sheltonham High School is partnering with High Tech High, which is a um, project-based learning district in California. And um, we, in, in that partnership, they are hosting on their website exemplary project work that is being done in our district. We are the only district in the entire country that is partnering and that they are showing um, our exemplary work um, throughout the country. So I think that's quite an accomplishment um, and then it's a test uh, for the work that's being done in our district by our students and also by our teachers um, in the project-based learning. In addition to that work that was um, sh uh, showcased, there were other examples of work that our students and our teachers um, are delivering in the project-based um, learning space. Our... Um, Next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May 19th. 
that is a change from the May 18th, Tuesday, May 18th date that it would normally be held on, and that is due to the election. And that concludes my uh, report. Next on the agenda is facilities. Burdell Williams. Yep, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, the May facilities uh, presentation featured um, building updates across the district, uh, as well as a school dude update uh, on maintenance activities um, and a brief uh, comment period on the renewable energy resolution to be discussed uh, shortly after my report. Uh, Mr. Teasdale started off the meeting uh, sharing an update regarding the uh, structural uh, engineering repairs uh, to be completed on the exterior wall of Stratton Hall. Um, this project, I'd say, is likely two or three years in the making at this point um, after a series of you know, bid processes and, and contract conversations. Um, the, the administration is going to be presenting tonight uh, at, 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 the, uh, at the completion of my report, uh, a bid uh, for this work to commence uh, starting on June 21st, once students are out of the building and completing uh, approximately a month after that on July 23rd. Uh, just for some small background on this particular project, um, there was, there's a failed section of the stone soffit attachment on the outside of the building uh, that also uh, exposed a failed metal rod anchor uh, that is set to be repaired, not just to uh, restore the appearance of the building, but also to ensure safety uh, of the exterior portion of the building that is currently damaged and has, uh, has, uh, has failed. Um, the proposal uh, includes a replacement of the cast stones with a laminate metal fascia panel and drip edge to help shed water. Um, there will be a final review prior to the commencement of the project. Uh, again, I'm really excited that this is going to happen. We can get the caution tape off the front of the building and, and um, better show the front side of our, our beautiful structure. Uh, Mr. Teasdale went on to share updates from across the district. Things have been relatively quiet now that snow season is over and we're in between that awesome part of the year where we don't have to really rely on heat and air conditioning. Um, but there was uh, some minor HVAC issues at Glenside that were shared with the board and community during the facilities presentation. Uh, Mr. Teasdale then also shared uh, that the glycol pipe repair that was previously discussed at both the March, March and February uh, facilities presentations and facilities committee meetings um, will be scheduled once there is some language that is confirmed uh, with at the recommendation of the school solicitor. Um, just for some context for those who uh, you know haven't had an opportunity to review. The uh, facilities presentation can be found on the district's website. And inside of that presentation is a, is a, a very graphic uh, picture that will uh, share all of the specifics about the piping changes and also piping upgrades um, that will improve access to the glycol lines and also help with any future repairs, but more so um, hopefully circumvent the need for any future repairs and greatly appreciative for the efforts to, to uh, and the amount of foresight required in, in making that decision. Um, moving on, uh, there was a school dude update uh, regarding open and closed work orders. Um, that school dude system is still, again, for the community tracking all work orders. Uh, executed across the district, both uh, preventative maintenance work orders and corrective maintenance work orders, um, helping us better maintain uh, our buildings, not just the, the aging buildings, but more specifically uh, addressing the need to ensure that our new buildings are managed from, from, the, from the cradle and on through the lifetime of the building to ensure that we can get 
the uh, the most amount of life as possible out of the buildings themselves and all of their components. Uh, lastly, on the agenda was the re renewable energy resolution that was also shared as a draft at the March uh, facilities committee meeting. Um, the board has taken some time to again revise this draft numerous times and also uh, give the opportunity for the public to have uh, some amount of feedback on it as well at uh, that being from the time given at the facilities committee meetings for both April and March um, and tonight that will be presented uh, as a resolution uh, for adoption uh, in front of the board and the community. The that concludes my report the next facilities present the next facilities committee meeting uh, will meet on June 1st I believe will be before finance on this particular night not sure of the order uh, and that meeting will be held virtually that concludes my report two action items and we do have two action items if uh, Miss Harding if you could scroll a little bit um, so I will I will read these separately. Um, the facilities committee recommends the administration authorize the approval of the high school auditorium external wall repair to be completed by Mun Roofing for a cost of fifty thousand eight hundred dollars. Do I have a motion? So moved. First, Mr. Fishbon. Is there a second? Second, Jennifer Loman. Second, Ms. Lohman, thank you. Is there any board comment? Seeing none, uh, I will take this by acclamation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion passes, thank you. And item B for adoption tonight, the facilities committee recommends the presentation of the renewable energy resolution. Ms. Harding, if you could possibly open the PDF version of the Renewable Energy Resolution, I will not read it in, in, in its entirety. Um, however, I would like to have the community have the opportunity to view if we could. Uh, if not, we will, uh, sorry, the resolution. Oh, sorry. So while, while you're opening that, Ms. Harding, thank you. Um, I do want to share um, just with the community that um, we're circulating this resolution for adoption tonight by the board. Um, the resolution is work that was started back in 2019 uh, while myself and Mr. Cohen were co-chairs of facilities. Um, we really tabled the conversation regarding the resolution in early 2020 as our attention clearly turned to COVID-19. Um, just some brief history of the document. Uh, the document truly uh, began with inspiration from the community at large, most specifically Mr. Rick Topper, a retired CHS teacher and environmental justice advocate, as well as uh, timely action by the Cheltenham Township Commissioners and additional inspiration from the efforts of efforts and energy of board members, students, and additional community members. Um, the resolution culminated between meetings between the facilities co-chairs and administration in late 2019 or early 2020 um, to truly clarify the expectations on this board action uh, from an aspirational perspective as we move toward a more sustainable Cheltenham School District. Uh, very recently, the facilities committee uh, met with administration and members of this cabinet to, to truly hear uh, comments regarding um, the energy from our student ambassadors who are seeking to make lasting change in Cheltenham regarding sustainability. And we were uh, very much so inspired by that effort as well and felt that it was very timely that we bring this resolution to the public and most specifically to the board for adoption, understanding also that 
our board policy on on sustainability is also up for adoption. Sorry, up for review and potential adoption um, as a part of the uh, policy committee agenda for next month. And I believe we have the resolution here. And I will read from my agenda. Sorry about that. I will read. From my agenda that the facilities committee recommends the presentation of the renewable energy resolution for adoption. Is there a motion? So move, Mr. Cohen. So move. Mr. Hayward. Oops. Okay, that that was yeah, that was good. I I heard a first from Mr. Cohen. Thank you, and a second from. Sounded like Mr. Schultz was first. Is there any more comment on the matter? Seeing none, I'll take the um, vote. Sorry, I did the hand raise thing again. Oh, I had a completely different screen up. My apologies. Go ahead, Mr. Schultz. Uh, and I now see there are two others. Um, I just wanted to say, first off, thank you, Mr. Burdelliams, for the, uh, the, the history of this document. Um, and thank you to all of the stakeholders you mentioned who have put energy into it. Um, I wanted to note that while this resolution doesn't specify specific timelines for goals, it does reflect um, and it does reflect a level of momentum that is already manifesting in policy discussions, um, potential task forces to, to take action as outlined in this document around planning. Um, and so it, it may not look like it has teeth, but it, the sentiment is real and, and is already translating into impact. So um, the energy management policy has been um, under discussion in the policy committee, but as part of that discussion, we have already identified many different paths of exploration that we would like to, um, we as, as a committee would like to find ways to explore in more depth. Um, so that way next year we will be able to, to uh, give it a level of treatment similar to the, the treatment of, uh, of our equity policy, which took quite some time and a fair amount of research by many people uh, to get where, where it is. So just wanted to mention all of that. Thank you again, Mr. Burdell Williams for, for your role and Mr. Cohen for your roles in pushing this forward. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. And Mr. Fishbein, I believe your hand was up next. Um, I, I just want to stress how important this work is, how um, much I support it, and how much I appreciate that our students in particular have been leading this conversation in a way that is incredibly productive and that demonstrates that what we teach our students in Cheltenham is in part how to be a good public advocate. They came to us petitioning us as a board to do this work and this is the product of their good work and I want to acknowledge that to the board and the community. Thank you. Certainly. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Mrs. Haywood. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that anybody said because I think you guys said it very well. So I just did a comment to Mr. Schultz and Mr. Fishbein. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I see no more hands from the board. So I'll take this by affirmation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And the resolution passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burdell Williams. Um, that concludes your business. It's time to move on. Next item on the agenda is liaison group, Mr. Cohen. Let me just wait. 
you're in the building with a good Wi-Fi, but it sounds like you have a bad connection. The liaison group met on in 19th, and the liaison group was a group of on April 19th at 8 a.m. And it's a group of school board um, members and township commissioners and also senior staff. And at that meeting, a number of items were addressed. There was a follow-up on the township to propose stormwater fees. Very briefly, the township is investigating imposing stormwater fees on all properties in the township, and that will be used to help make stormwater improvements related to flooding and also stormwater management practices. And there was then an update on the township's comprehensive plan development. The comprehensive plan is being done to help shape future development and direction in the township. And that process is now underway. There was then a brief conversation on pilots, which is payment in lieu of taxes. And it was talked about having a separate meeting on pilots with both the township and school district. Very briefly, payment in lieu of taxes or pilots is an initiative whereby nonprofit properties and owners in some situations pay um, fees or, or make donations actually um, to the township and possibly the school district in lieu of paying taxes in that they're nonprofit entities and they're exempt of course from real estate taxes. There was then a good conversation on update on school zones and timing for traffic flashing lights and um, trying to coordinate this better and uh, coordination did occur after the meeting. There was then a discussion on update on police presence at or in buildings when schools reopen, and there was a conversation about that. There was next talked about was improving trash pickup around the properties for the school district. A specific note um, is a fence line along Cedarbrook, and 309 um, is a corridor that has a lot of trash and litter and debris. And the township is working with PennDOT and property owners to get that under control, including the school district, and is trying to identify where the trash originates from. And the school district is paying more attention now to um, that property in specific, because again, trash um, has a tendency to blow and get stuck at or near or along the fence. There was then a discussion and acknowledgement on Dr. Mercedes' resignation and well wishes for the future for him. There was um, a discussion about land development updates in the township and um, a little bit of discussion about, about Ashford Meadows and Ashford Meadows is a former Ashford Country Club and houses are supposed to go on sale sometime starting the spring on that property. Um, under new business, there is discussion about the township trying to um, identify and secure lifeguards. For people that do not know, the township pools are opening this summer shortly and they're still looking for lifeguards and the school district is working to help get word out about that. So if anybody um, is an approved certified lifeguard, including students, I encourage them to go to the township's website and identify those opportunities. The next meeting of the liaison group is scheduled for um, Monday the 17th at 8 a.m. and that completes my report, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Next on the agenda is the policy committee, Ms. Haywood. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. The policy committee met on Wednesday, April the 28th at 8 a.m. via Zoom. After roll call, the minutes of the March 24th, 2021 meeting were approved before the committee turned to old business. This evening, there's just one policy presented for the board adoption and several policies that are listed as first read policies. Um, over the past several years, uh, the policy committee has focused on updating policies that are more than 10 years old, consolidating policies, and identifying policies requiring changes due to changes in the law or policy updates that address and improve practices um, in our school district. I wanted to briefly thank Mr. Roos, Mr. Diazio, and uh, Ms. Tolbert Jackson for their work over the last several years in bringing many policies to the policy committee um, for review and adoption. Um, the first policy that the policy committee reviewed was um, policy in AR 209, health and, and dental examinations. And this policy in AR are presented this evening for adoption. This policy is from 2019, not an old policy, but there are minor updates to coincide with current practices and compliance with the law with respect to administering health and dental examinations to our students. The next policy we discussed was policy in AR 200, enrollment of students. This policy was first discussed in the March um, meeting 
during which there was a um, fairly lengthy discussion um, around ensuring that this policy, as well as the policy in AR governing registration, student registration, be implemented in an anti-racist manner. Policy in AR 200, um, was, those were adopted to include legal changes addressing the adjudication verification process um, so that they would be applied in a non-racist manner. Due to the number of changes to this policy and because of the request by the policy committee to revisit this policy in conjunction with our registration um, policy, um, this is considered a revised first read and we'll come back to the policy committee um, later this month for further review. Policy in AR 214 um, was next on the agenda and that um, is related to computing GPA and determining class rank. And this was recently updated um, in 19, 20, 2019 in response to a community member's request to look at this policy in toto. Initially, when we had a review of this policy, we determined that we would exclude determination of class rank consistent with um, practices in other surrounding school districts, as well as colleges and universities that are many of them no longer looking at um, class rank. Based on concerns that were made to the computation of the GPA under this policy, there were still some concerns that the unweighted GPA would be calculated unevenly depending on the classes that a student may take and the um, point, the quality points that a student would receive depending if they were taking an honors AP or college prep class. With that in mind, Dr. Smith um, took that policy back to CHS administration for some additional minor tweaks. And that again is being provided this evening for a first read. And we'll come back to the policy committee for final review at the, um, this month's meeting. The next policy discussed was policy in AR 823 energy management. And based on the resolution passed earlier this evening, the board is committed as Mr. Schultz indicated to sustainability and sustainability practices. However, since we do not currently have a sustainability plan, uh, we don't currently have key performance indicators and or measurable goals to evaluate any progress against our sustainability um, intentions. So even with that in mind, we did receive some excellent comments from, from the CHS students about the policy that will require further review by the policy committee and the board and probably further community discussion. And given the sustainability resolution that was adopted this evening and the additional comments that we received, again, this policy is, um, putting, is being put forward this evening as a first read. And again, we'll come back to the policy committee um, later this month. The last policy on the policy agenda um, was po a new policy, 150, Title I Comparability of Services. This policy was drafted to comply with the law and ensures that there is no discrimination in the amount and use of Title I funds um, from, from the state or federal government between and among Title I schools. Um, as Mr. Fishbein mentioned earlier, the memorandum of understanding between the school district and the Cheltenham police is under revision. Um, as revised, um, we are taking in consideration the elimination of the discre uh, discretionary and recommended reporting categories. And, um, and, and those have been presented to the police. I only mention this because I know that this was, we've received many comments from Police Free CSD and wanted to let the community know that the MOU as well as the student disciplinary discipline policy will be on the agenda later this month as well. Uh, that was not on the policy committee agenda for this month, um, but nonetheless, we wanted to put it on the agenda for, for May, I said for last month. So with that in mind, um, that concludes my report, but do I have a motion to adopt policy in AR 209, health and dental examinations? So moved. Mr. Fishbein, second, Charles Burdell Williams. Thank you. First is Mr. Fishbein. Second is Mr. Burdell Williams. Do I have any board comment? Seeing none, we'll take this by voice acclamation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. The motion carries. The next policy committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, May the 26th at 8 a.m. via Zoom. 
All members of the community are welcome to attend this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to communications, Ms. Lohman. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. The communications committee convened on over Zoom on Thursday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, Mr. Fishbein presided over the meeting and there were three community members in attendance. After roll call and approval of the minutes from the March 25th communications committee meeting, Director of Communications Kevin Kaufman presented on two items, um, athletic communications and activities communications. He presented on the different ways the communications office um, connects with its constituents using athletics and activities to tell the district's positive stories about its students. For each topic, the presentation included slides on student recognitions and news on the website, social media campaigns, and social media posts. Examples included social media campaigns for senior athlete, ce athlete celebrations and spotlights on the theory of relativity cast members and student council members. Mr. Kaufman also spoke about how the department has been using Google Sites to create season-specific sports pages and about the success of streaming high school and middle school events, which I can personally say I took advantage of watching those events being live streamed. Mr. Kaufman reported that there were 39 streaming events held in the past 90 days, and those events garnered 17,000 views and 3,200 hours of watch time. Finally, Mr. Kaufman discussed how communications has been partnering with various departments and schools to host virtual events, such as the high school and middle school concerts and school-based events like the Cheltenham Elementary Spelling Bee. The entire slide presentation is available on the district's website. The next communications committee meeting, which will be the final one of the 2020-2021 school year, will be held on Thursday, May 27th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. This concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Uh, Ms. Haywood, legislative. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. This may be a little lengthy. There's a lot of activity in Harrisburg and at the federal level. Um, and so this report hopefully will provide an overview of both as it relates to um, legislation impacting public education. Uh, the Montgomery County School District Legislative Committee last met on April the 21st via Zoom. Um, much of the focus of that meeting was on really um, ways to advocate for charter school reform and any um, success, successful advocacy efforts we could undertake. Um, this evening, I will again provide just an overview of some federal and state legislation impacting um, public education, starting with legislation at the federal level. Um, as reported last month on April the 9th, 2021, President Biden um, released his fiscal year 2022 budget proposal. Um, as we all know, the proposal seeks a 40.8% increase from last year's um, Department of Education um, budget. Investments in early education and K through 12 education include significant investments in Title I funding, special ed education IDA related pre-K to K, pre-K to 12 grants, student well-being and wraparound services, as well as child care. Um, uh, block grants as well. On May the 5th, the Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education um, held a hearing on the proposed um, budget from President Biden with um, the current Secretary of Education, Miguel Cordova, Cordona, um, as the only witness. The education portion of the White House request includes $102.8 billion for the Department of Education, which is a welcomed 41% increase over the 2021 enacted level. In his remarks, Secretary Cardona commented that generations of inequity have left far too many students without equitable access to high quality, inclusive learning opportunities and recognize that education can be the great equalizer. To that end, the 2022 budget proposed by for the Department of Education provides strong investments for key areas to ensure that all students of all ages will have the same opportunities um, to do well in school. 
to schools to assist schools reopen in the fall. Um, the Department of Education also launched the Safe Schools and Campuses Best Practices uh, Clearinghouse, which is a website that includes um, highlights how high schools, colleges, and universities are safely reopening campuses. And it includes best practices that have been learned over the last year and shared um, actually nationally with all school districts. At the state level, on Monday, the Senate Education Committee held a hearing on a number of bills um, and all bills were approved and moved out of the committees. Some I'll just highlight here, which include Senate Bill 73, which is a school mandate waiver program. The bill would uh, reinstate the mandate waiver program to allow public schools to apply to the Department of Education at the state level for a waiver of certain state um, required mandates. Another one is Senate Bill 66, um, 666, no, 664, excuse me, optional year of education. And this bill would allow parents that um, the option to have their child repeat a grade level during the 21-22 school year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this bill would also extend the option to parents of special education students, specifically allowing those students to continue uh, beyond uh, their 20, if they reach 21 years of age. Um, at the, on the state budget side, as we are looking at our own budget, um, the state budget is currently under a review and it, um, the legislation legislature is really looking at hopefully adopting that before the June 30th deadline that they have. Um, we'll see. Um, it's a very aggressive proposed budget by Governor Wolf that I think would add a lot of additional funding to school districts. Um, however, it has been strongly opposed um, by, by certain legislators um, with respect to the size of the budget. And then as relates to charter reform, uh, the governor um, scheduled some press conferences geographically in the eastern, central, and western regions of the state uh, regarding uh, charter school reform mechanisms. On April the 15th, Superintendent Frank Gallagher from the Satterton Area School District and Jim Scanlon from Westchester Area School District spoke on behalf of the Eastern region, our region and our school districts in support of the proposed charter school reforms. Um, again, as we've discussed earlier this evening, our charter school report um, costs have actually almost tripled in the last year. Um, we're facing you know, significant costs as it relates to charter school reform. And as Mr. Schultz had asked earlier in the meeting, if you currently are in a cyber charter school, um, we are reaching out to you and actively soliciting you to come back to our school district as we reopen in the fall. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention um, that the election is next Tuesday on May the 18th. There are four constitutional amendment questions. And those, the first question, if approved by the voters, would provide a new exception to traditional legislative procedures by allowing the General Assembly to terminate or extend a disaster emergency declaration um, approved by the governor. This would really circumvent the governor's ability and flexibility to make critical decisions during a, a pandemic or any other emergency. The second question would allow, allow the governor to retain the authority to issue an initial disaster emergency declaration, and, um, but would reduce that permissible length from 90 to only 21 days. Given the length of the COVID-19 pandemic, that surely would delay any um, efficiencies at the state level for critical decisions that have to be made very timely um, given the length of certain um, pandemics or certain emergencies. There are two other ballot questions and one, if approved, would create a constitutional prohibition against restricting or denying an individual's equal rights under Pennsylvania law because of race or ethnicity. And um, the last amendment applies to Pennsylvania state, county, and local governmental entities and uh, guarantees equal equality rights under the law. Um, I wanted to pose to any students who may be on the call this evening 
Um, we are still looking for some students to work the polls next Tuesday. If you're interested in doing so, please reach out to Virginia, excuse me, Valerie Green at VALG at Comcast.net. Poll workers are paid $225 for the day and students will receive community service um, service credits. Um, and if you are interested in, in getting credits, please contact Mr. Hoff. Um, that concludes my report. And I just wanted to remind everyone to vote next Tuesday. We've got some great school board candidates on the slate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive report. And I second your observation that we have some great school board candidates on that slate. Um, moving on to administrative reports, personnel, Ms. Tolbert Jackson. Yes, good evening. Um, I'm submitting the following action items for consent agenda. Approval of changes in assignment A through C. Two, approval of service agreements A and B. Three is extra duty, extra pay A. Do I have a motion? Mr. Fishbein, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, about uh, action item 2B, the agreement for the nursing services. Um, it says the action item says that it's for supplemental substitute nursing services, which I'm happy to approve, except that the contracts that are attached are for the nursing services are appear to be for COVID testing. Is that is that what we're being asked to approve? It's for the nursing staff will be used for the vaccinations as well as any COVID testing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion? So move, Charles Bordeaux Williams. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Bill England. Is there any further board discussion or questions? Being none, I'll call the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, that motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Tolbert Jackson. Um, the following are the informational items, retirements A through E, resignations A, three non-discretionary leaves of absence, a through C. That concludes your report. That concludes my report, yes. Thank you. And we'll move on to educational affairs, Dr. Smith. Mr. Fishbein, can I just make one comment? You may. Um, thank you. Um, for the, um, again, in terms of the retirements that were noted um, under Ms. Tolbert Jackson's report is Dr. Cheryl Horsey. And again, I just wanted to note for the record, although I put it in the chat personally to Dr. Horsey, that she will really sorely be missed. I mean, she has provided a tremendous amount of not just service, but compassion, authenticity, knowledge, um, and warmth to the families in our school district and the students in our school district. And I just wanted to personally thank her um, for her years of service to our school district. Thank you. Any other board comments? Yep, I have a brief one as well, Mr. Fishbein, again, regarding uh, re retirements uh, and, and resignations. Um, just again, I, I feel like I've been in the district for a long time now. Um, I used to say I wasn't here, but for, for a few years, but it seems like I've, I've interacted with so many people who, um, who are leaving the district. Um, Ms. Gordon uh, over at at Myers uh, held me in check in the library quite a few times with her baked goods. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Abdul Rahim, although uh, never taught uh, either of my children as they went through Glenside, was always awesome. Every time I saw her communicating with children, I just felt like she really, really, really knew how to connect with, with the elementary school uh, community. And it was really amazing to see. 
um, Miss Bibbs over at at Wincoat for holding me accountable for making sure I'm out of the building on time with my uh, with my baseball program during our winter workouts um, and and really holding me in check, making sure I'm actually the right person who should actually be there. I, I greatly appreciate her, um, you know, being a good steward of our building. Um, Dr. Horsey, uh, just really can't speak um, highly enough of, of Dr. Horsey. Um, you know, going back to, I think, our first interaction when we first, uh, when the district was first exploring positive, positive psychology and holding sessions um, during the day to have community engagement. Um, she actually asked my opinion and I thought that was amazing. At the time, I was just the dad of a, of a four-year-old and a, and a third grader. So I'm, I'm, I'm greatly appreciative for that. And um, I'm lucky enough to live in her neighborhood. Um, so I'll see her even though she won't be in the building. So I'm greatly appreciative for, for, for all of those efforts um, of those who have, are, are gonna be leaving the district. Thank you. Any further board comments? Okay, now, uh, now we can move on to educational affairs. Thank you for all of those comments. Uh, appreciate very much. Dr. Smith. I'm submitting the following as a consent agenda. One, approval of conferences two, approval of agreement, and three, approval of continuation of contract for the 2021-2022 school year. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. A second. Second, Mr. Lohman. First was Ms. Haywood, second, Ms. Lohman. Um, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, we'll move on to financial affairs, Mr. Schott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Uh, we, are, we have two items uh, for consent approval this evening. Uh, the first of which being uh, the approval of April's bills. Uh, and the second being the approval of the student accident insurance through Axis Insurance Company. You do I have a motion? So move, Charles Burdell Williams. And the second. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you. Um, now we've reached the time in the meeting for public comments on non-agenda items. And um, there aren't very many people here. So uh, I see a bunch of hands raised. Uh, and you can just go in order of from top to bottom. I think that's the order that they raised their hands, Mr. Hoffman, you can give them access to the mic. And when you when you first talk, please say where in the township you live, like Elkins Park, Glenside, Wincote, Lavrock, Beltonham Village. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I just like to say on behalf of Police Free CSD, oh, excuse me, I'm Isabella Dolan and I live in Cheltenham Village. On behalf of Police Free CSD, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nancy Hacker as our interim superintendent upon Dr. Marseille's departure and ask for more information about her history and commitment to equity. Minority enrollment overall in Springfield School District is 19% of the student population, which is a stark difference from Cheltenham's 55% Black, 7% multiracial, 6% Asian, 3% Hispanic, and 1% Indigenous population. What is the board's plan for transition to ensure she is well equipped to oversee Cheltenham's diverse population? How will the commitment to end the school to prison pipeline continue under her leadership? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, 
Dr. Marseille, do you mind if I just answer that real quickly? Because I have an answer. I, I have no um, problem with you answering that, Mr. Fishbaum. Okay, uh, Ms. Dolan, um, in our consideration of candidates, uh, Dr. Hacker rose to the top in large part because of the work that she has done on equity. And um, she, she gave us a specific example that truly blew us away about work that she did in the Haddon Heights School District, where um, one of the feeding districts to that district a K to eight district whose students went to high school in Haddon Heights um, were majority black, large majority black. And they were coming into a school that was majority white um, into a high school. And um, Dr. Hacker was the first to eliminate barriers to entry into honors and AP courses for that group of students that had traditionally been excluded from those courses. In addition, she has done work in Springfield that um, was very significant in changing curriculum to um, follow the practices of the Sub Southern Poverty Leadership Council in um, teaching history in a way that fairly reflects the United States actual history and represents indigenous experiences more accurate, accurately as history. So those were examples of her commitment to equity, even though she comes from a district that was uh, that had a much smaller minority of, of um, minorities than we have in this majority minority district. But thank you for that question. It was something that we seriously considered and were incredibly impressed with the answers. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Liza Maris. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm a resident of Wincote and an alumna of Cheltenham. Um, I'd like to speak a moment on the new MOU revision that you say has removed both the discretionary and the recommended sections. Um, this is an incredible step forward for the district and I'm really excited to see the benefits to our students come to fruition in the future. This is clearly a result of the work that was begun, that has begun years ago with the creation and development of the board's equity policy and the deep conversations and careful work it took to write it. This is why I moved back to Cheltenham. I wanted to raise my children in a community and a school system that takes bold and courageous steps forward towards a more equitable future that provides endless opportunities for our students to thrive and grow. I'm not jealous of anyone who holds elected office in this great reckoning against systemic racism. No matter where you stand, the ground is certainly shaking under us. The courage and vision it takes to rise above the volcanic nature of change to do what's right is rare. And I want to acknowledge the hard work and probably a gazillion hours you spent thinking about and discussing this issue, as well as the many more hours I know you will spend on the discipline policy. Usually I quote a black ancestor, but tonight I feel compelled to quote you. This is an excerpt from President Fishbein's email. The board knows it must help dismantle the school to prison pipeline in this country and is committed to adopting policies and practices to eliminate its impact on Cheltenham students. You have certainly proven the truth of this statement with this MOU revision, and I thank you for it. This will surely impact generations to come and is worthy of recognition and replication in other schools. You are truly visionary leaders, and I look forward to further collaboration in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Venus. Um, I go to CHS, I'm from Elkins Park. Um, and I'm just speaking on behalf of Police Free CSD tonight. And I want to acknowledge that in an email to Police Free CSD, the board did commit to propose an MOU that 
remove the recommended and discretionary reporting sections and is fully in line with our request. And so we thank the school board for this commitment and look forward to making public comments again when this, comment, when this document is discussed at the policy committee meeting on May 26th. Um, we still wanna read a letter from our allies, the Education Law Center on our demands in hopes that they will inform how the board changes discipline policy to 18. Um, Ashley Gills Perkins of the Education Law Center writes, Police Free CSD's campaign is a part of a national call for less police, more counselors, and a shared goal to fight against the school to prison pipeline. The need for change in our state is clear. Despite advocates' cries for reform, the number of school police and resource officers in Pennsylvania has increased over the last decade. As a result, Pennsylvania has the third highest student arrest rate of black and brown students in the country. Specifically in Montgomery County, black students make up roughly 13% of the student population but they were suspended at a rate three times higher than what would be expected. Police presence in schools is directly linked to increased student arrest and referrals to law enforcement, and is further associated with increased rates of exclusionary discipline or out-of-school suspensions and expulsions. School-based arrest, exclusionary discipline, and their associated negative consequences disproportionately affect students of color and students with disabilities. Research has found that Black students are disciplined and arrested at greater rates, even for the same or less serious behavior as white students. Our state is not immune from these impacts, as already discussed. In fact, Pennsylvania nearly leads the nation in such stark racial disparities when it comes to discipline. We can turn this around. Students have been leading this change, and I urge Chauntham School Board to follow their lead. Students not just end up in detention and in jails and prisons. Too often schools are the catalyst of the school to prison pipeline. We have an opportunity to focus on keeping students in schools, ensuring they have resources, books, counselors, and services that they need to reach success. Through the MOU revisions, specifically the removal of both discretionary and recommended referrals to law enforcement, through changes to the code of conduct, and through a commitment to emphasize restoration over retribution, we can truly begin to address root issues and systematic systemic racism that permeates our school environments. The Education Law Center fully supports Police Free CSD Coalition and the request for the board to consider our meaningful changes. So that was only a portion of the letter from the Education Law Center that I shared with you all, but this excerpt speaks to how crucial it is for the board and the Cheltenham community to actively work to create equitable environments for its students and to dismantle the structures that continue to harm Black and Brown students. Um, if anyone would like to read the full letter, all of our open letters written in support of our coalition can be found on our link tree, and we thank this board for its support on this initiative. Thank you, Venus. Um, we did receive, we as a board received that letter, and we all had an opportunity to read it, but thank you for pointing it out, and um, thank you for your work. I think Ms. Loman, I see your hand raised, but I think Oops, sorry. Did you wanna did you wanna say something in response to that? I, I did, but I can wait. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dana Burnley and I'm a parent of a seventh grader at Seabrook Middle School. I have two questions for you. Um, and Ms. Um, Dolman was the first one from the public who kind of asked this question, but mine has a different spin. So um, this question is regarding the incoming interim superintendent, superintendent Dr. Thacker. Since it's public knowledge um, that the Springfield School District has um, a, a percentage of about 22% of African-American students in the Springfield Montgomery County School District and um, CHS, sorry, not CHS, but school, the Seltonham School District has over 50%, around 55. What are her plans? Um, and I know she's, she'll just be interim to continue the work of diversity regarding specifically our students of color. That's my first question. My second question 
is regarding uniforms, um, specifically football uniforms at Cedarbrook. Um, I have been told by some very concerned parents that the uniforms are over 10 years old. As a parent of a soon to be rising seventh grader that wishes to play, this concerns me as well. It is known that the soccer, baseball, tennis, lacrosse, and softball teams at CBK have received newer uniforms. In addition, there was a previous communication meeting that I joined where the same issue was addressed as a question to the board. My question is, what is the district doing to ensure that the players have new uniforms for the upcoming football season in the fall? Please keep in mind that a large amount of players that are interested are African-American boys. Thank you for your time. And this concludes my questions. Um, in order to answer the first question, I think we're going to have to ask Dr. Hacker to um, prepare a response that will be presented at the next okay. um, next meeting. Um, as far as the uniforms, Dr. Marseille, can you answer that? Uh, no, I cannot. We'll have to answer that at the next meeting as well. Okay, I'll make sure that, that I will attend. Thank you so much okay. for your time. You're mm -hmm. welcome. My name is Novice Ezel from Glenside. I'm speaking on behalf of the Sheltonham High School Panther Football Association. We are gravely concerned about the decision that has been made to not renew the contract of our head football coach, Ryan Nace. Before going any further, I wanted to make our de desire very clear. We want his position as head football coach to be reinstated. There are many reasons why we believe Coach Nace should be our head coach. We cannot list them all tonight. However, I would like to list several facts about Coach Nace that we pr prove that prove that he is right man for the job. I will have three categories. First, Coach Nace supports the Sheltonham community and beyond. In 2017 and 2018, Coach Nace represented the Sheltonham Panthers and ran in the 9-11 Heroes Run, which raised money for the Travis Mason Foundation. In 2018, Coach Nace um, began the tradition of the Pink Out Game, which he sold pink t-shirts, snacks, all proceeds benefited the Soma G. Coleman Fund. The players wore pink socks to honor those affected by breast cancer. Sheltonham Community breast cancer survivors were invited on it during the pregame. In 2018, NACE began the tradition of inclusion by inviting honorary captains in which students with disabilities joined our team captains in the coin toss. In 2019, NACE took honorary captains a step further and partnered with athletes helping athletes in which varsity athletes began spending their entire program pregame with unified sports athletes. This formed lifelong bonds between all athletes and was the focus of a new segment on CBS News. Over the past few years, under Coach Nace's leadership, our team attended and volunteered at Lawrence First and Gold, where over $2 million was raised for pediatric brain cancer. Coach Nace and the team have participated in the Sheltonham Little League cleanup days. Nace worked with Sheltonham community members to start the Panthers Par Club. The initiative brought students from elementary schools in Elkins Park to Friday night games. This was a great way for children to and their families to get excited about their future at Sheldon High School. Coach Nace and some team members participate in the Porter Plunge for raising money for Special Olympics. Under his leadership, the Panthers worked with and hosted tournaments, supported Gregory Hingard Memory Memorial Fund, and raised $30,000 for children in need following a death of a parent. Coach Nace volunteered at Beyond the Field, where he won the Pro Bowl Community Recognition Award which comes with $30,000 in new football equipment, including top of the line helmets. The players may be surprised to hear this. It was supposed to be a surprise to them. However, due to this unprecedented circumstance, we felt as though we needed to make sure the community is aware that this grant was won in the name of Coach Ryan Nace. Because of all that, it comes to no surprise to us, to the football, par to the football parents, that Coach Nace is the recipient of the 2021 More Than a Coach Award presented by the Philadelphia Eagles. This award comes with a $4,000 grant for our athletic department. The Eagles media interviewed and filmed our players on March 4th. We are anxious and waiting to see this be aired. We understand that the release is being held up by the Sheltonham School District Communications Department. We hope that the district will give the, give the Eagles the release so that the community can see it. Two, he cares about players as individuals. Coach Ryan Ace gladly, gladly helps students whenever there is any type of need. He uses free time to help students with academics. He attends IEP meetings. 
He personally purchased prom tickets and rent tuxedos for players who were in need. When a player um, fell, family fell in need, a family fell in need. He organized a clothing drive for, for the family and raised three thousand dollars. Coach Nace is tough on players academically. He has high expectations and offer encouragement all the way. He contacts parents when their children do not perform academically. He talks to players about their future. He spends hours of his free time creating highlight films for each individual player. Under his leadership, there has been a 100% graduation rate among his players in the last four years. 14 players over the two years have received opportunities to play college football. Three have received Division I full scholarships. Each year before COVID-19, Coach Nace hand washed each player's uniform. Coach Nace went to the extreme and admirable lengths to assist homeless student, a homeless student during the pandemic. And three, he is an excellent football coach with a proven winning record. When Coach Nace started at Sheltonham, there were only 35 students participating in the football program. That number has nearly doubled under his leadership. He works closely with, parent, with the Parents Football Association and raises money to provide for team dinners, travel outfits, and new uniform. Coach Nace has led the team through three straight winning seasons for the first time in 20 years. Who could forget our 2019 season? We won the district. We won the Suburban League. We won the first undefeated Suburban One title in Sheltonham High School history. We made it to the state championship and had an opportunity to play in Hershey, PA. We do not think that our coach is a perfect man by any means. Like all of us, he has flaws that could use some work. However, surely all of the factors listed above outweigh the flaws that can be worked on. It takes years to build a solid football program. Coach Nace did it in two years. As parents, we are especially concerned for our rising juniors and seniors who are currently being recruited. Your time, I'm afraid your five minutes is, is uh, now on pass. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, there's still three more hands raised. Thank you for um, entertaining our comments. My name is Tony Ezel. I'm also from Glenside. Uh, the previous speaker was my wife. We have five children that attend uh, the school system here in Sheltonham. We have them all through, uh, one in Glenside, one in Elkins Park, one in Cedar Brook, and two in the high school. We have four sons. Each of them have an opportunity to play and have a great deal of fun playing football through this great community and establish great community contacts. Coach Nace, is a big reason why we entrusted our kids to plan in this system. He has um, been an integral part of bringing together Cedar Brooks football team as well as Shelton Ham's football team into a unified system. It's that type of foresight that makes Coach Nate stand out as a football visionary. And I know football may sound like a small thing, but let me tell you, there's nothing quite like football that helps a young man formulate a future. There's nothing quite like football that helps a young man put on discipline, put on hard work, put on toughness. And I have to tell you, um, holding myself back a little bit from being political, um, I believe that our young men can use some toughness. Our young men can use some accountability because that's what produces real men. And that's what produces real men that stand up in their communities and they do the right thing behind their families and behind the people who are less fortunate than themselves. Coach Nace has instilled that in our, in our young men. He's not perfect, just as my wife said, but I've watched him do some incredible things in the life of young men. And for that, I'll always be grateful. I know he needs to be held accountable for some of the things that have occurred just like the rest of us do. But I got to tell you, if we let him go, we will let go of a gym. There are tons of school districts that are going to want him as a head coach. I'm hoping that Sheldon Hill makes the right decision and reinstates his contract. Hashtag bring back Nace. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Liz Harris. I am from Cheltenham, uh, Melrose Park area. I have a seventh grader in Cedarbrook, and I have a fifth grader at EP. My question, which is obvious to the board, is: um, Are you aware? And this, I would like to direct to the vice president, since everybody's directing everything to Mr. Fishbean, um, Pam Henry. 
Um, are you aware as a board that we are quite concerned as parents, as community, as some educators on who you have chosen as interim uh, superintendent since she does not come from a diverse school district? And you know what? I'm sure the woman um, interviewed well, but experience and interviewing are two different things. That's one. My second um, statement or question is, with the charter schools. I will not lie to you, but I have considered taking very recently because of the actions of the school board. Um, some of us are looking to go elsewhere. And if one leaves, you know, two leave, three leave. I don't think a lot of them are gonna come back um, as you say they will. And it's costing us money and getting loans. And this is, you're all elected officials. You represent the taxpayer the parent, but most of all, you represent our children. So when you make your decisions, um, I would think twice about it. Elections are coming up, Ms. Haywood, you're right. Um, if Ms. Haywood would, uh, not Ms. Haywood, I'm sorry, if Ms. Henry could answer my question on the concerns that we have on the interim superintendent that you all chose. Thank you very much. Ms. Henry, do you have anything to say in response or do you wish to respond? Mr. Roos, does she have to respond? I mean, is that a... No, there's questions are not... Questions from the public should be directed towards the board as a whole. And then the board, the board decides who answers the question or board members decide whether to answer a particular question. In terms of the, um, the process, um, I can speak about that, is that... Uh, we reviewed all of the qualifications for all of the candidates that were placed in front of us. We had um, preliminary conversations about the bot their body of work, um, the goals and objectives of the school district, and um, their, the work that they would put in to help move or help sustain us in the interim process. So aside from that, in terms of the overall process, I'm not sure specifically um, what other additional information. It was um, a, a very you know, open process. Thank you. Um, so we have one more hand raised. Mr. Fishbein. My name is, oh, is that me? I, I just briefly want to just make sure it's clear to the public that Ms. Henry was not solely responsible for this decision. I, it's unclear to me why she was specifically asked that question. But for anybody listening, I hope that, that, um, that through that and through Ms. Henry's response, there's not a misconception that that she is responsible for a board decision. Um, I don't think that would be fair to Ms. Henry, and that's why I'm speaking up. Um, so I, I apologize for if I'm out of order in, in saying that. No, and, and just to be um, clear, the the decisions that we make as a board or as a an entire board, and I just wanted to give Ms. Henry the opportunity to respond if she wished to, um, and she did. So, um, Ms. Hoffman, you're up. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I am going to speak on behalf of the Parent Football Association, um, and I'm going to pick up where Novice left off. Um, she started saying that as parents, we are especially concerned for the rising juniors and seniors who are currently being recruited during this unprecedented time of pandemic. Um, how do we expect these rising juniors and seniors to perform well on the field, learn a new football program, perform well academically when you have removed the person who has proven 
that he can lead them to do so. We, the Cheltenham High School Panther Football Parents Association, are becoming exhausted fighting for our boys who just want to play football. Please do the right thing and reinstate Coach Ryan Nace's contract effective immediately. Sincerely, the Cheltenham High School Panther Football Parents Association. Um, so I was speaking on behalf of the Parents Association and now I would just like to add my personal comment. Coach Ryan Nace won the More Than a Coach Award. I believe it's well-deserved because he is indeed more than a coach, not only to the boys on the football team, but also to their parents, their families, and the Cheltenham community. He holds our boys accountable for their actions and for their academics. He cares about them physically, mentally, and emotionally. He reached out to them, painstakingly supported them through the COVID quarantine. On a personal note, he's helped my family and guided my family through some difficult decisions that we needed to make this past fall. He has also been instrumental as we begin the college search process for our son. The fact that he's a winning football coach is just a bonus to everything else that he has done for our players, our high school, and the entire Cheltenham community. So we're asking you that you please renew Coach Ryan Nace's contract. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Hoffman. Um, I live in Cheltenham, near Cheltenham Elementary. Um, I'm a student athlete. I'm on the football team. And uh, just like the past people said, um, Nace really has had a huge impact um, that I've seen over the past couple of years. I'm a junior. I'm going into my senior year. Um, he really does love each and every one of his players. Um, we, love, we all love him back. And I'm just asking that you renew his contract. Thank you. Ms. Harris, I see you have your hand raised again. Um, Mr. Roos, is there a one comment limit or? There is, we're coming for a minute to one per person. Okay, so I'm sorry, but our rules prohibit me from calling on you a second time. Um, Ms. Lohman, did you want to say something in response to some of the public comments? I did. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Um, I wanted to thank Police Free CSD and its uh, their allies for their advocacy, um, continued advocacy ar around the issues of the school to prison pipeline. I, I and certainly I support the removal of the discretionary and the re recommended sections from the MOU. I mean, I've never actually supported the existence of the MOUs to begin with or the passage of the Safe Schools Act back in 1995, but here we are. And, um, but what I wanted to say was that, and I wanna make it clear because I'm not sure that we've adequately communicated this piece of it. I think we've, we've said it to ourselves. I think we've said it in our heads, um, is that, the MOU is important and it, it's policy, but what where the real work needs to occur is at the building level. We cannot prohibit even for, we cannot prohibit staff from calling the police. Um, and so we can strongly dissuade them. We can put other steps in place. We can put preventative and intervention methods that do not involve police involvement. But at the end of the day, a staff member can still pick up their cell phone and call Cheltenham Township Police if they see something happening. So in my mind, the real work has to happen with the other points, the other demands that Police for ECSD has put forward in terms of improving, increasing the mental health supports that we offer in our buildings, um, continuing to um, improve the climate of 
relationship building, particularly in the high school among staff and students, um, doing continued anti-racist work with our with all of our staff. Um, I, I just want to make that very, very clear that even though we're spending a lot of time and important time on revisions to the MOU, that at the end of the day, we really have to work at a building level. We have to look at what we're going to look at in terms of our disciplinary policy. What do our student handbooks say? I mean, we're gonna be taking on all of that work, but I, I just wanna make it clear that um, by removing these sections from the MOU, it doesn't mean that staff will no longer be able to ever call the police on students. Unfortunately, that is not, we can't kind of remove that, <laughs> you know, sort of that, that possibility. We can make lots of changes to the MOU, we can, but what we really have to do is, is do the hard work at the building level to make sure that we have the right supports in place. So the necessity or the feeling that students need to be, you know, need to have police involvement doesn't happen in the first place. And so I just wanted to make that clear because I feel like we, we I think that we seem to know that, but um, for me, that's an important thing to kind of put out there and, and say is, um, and, and I hope that, you know, I know with some of our ESSER dollars, the money from the federal government as a result of the pandemic and some of the other things we are looking into providing additional mental health supports in our buildings. And I'm really hoping that that can move forward. I'm really hoping that we'll also be able to sort of pick up our PBIS work once, you know, we're back in the buildings and really kind of continue to put that into full effect, particularly at the high school level. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, make those comments. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. We have one more hand raised. Hi, uh, I'm Martin Latimer from Shellingham High School. I am a soon to be alum of Shellingham High School in the next few weeks. I played football for Coach Neese since I was a freshman. And uh, I would like to give my insight on everything that's going on. Um, personally, I feel that Coach Neese is a very special coach. And I feel that he is a once in a lifetime coach that can change many kids' lives. I've seen it done every single day when I walk in the building and every single time we stepped on the field. I feel that uh, he's a very special person behind being a coach. Even with everything that's going on, he still reaches out to us and provides us with information that we need for camps or coaches numbers to get us to the next level. Uh, in my experience, Without Coach Nace, I wouldn't be able to play at the next level, which I'm going to play at the next level at Widener University. And I feel that you guys need someone like Coach Nace to be a leader and a coach for our football team to keep our community together, which he has done, which means for me, I feel that he should be reinstated. Thank you very much. I will call on Charles. Sorry, go ahead, Charles. Yep, just to be I'm very sorry. brief, Mr. Burdell Williams. I just go ahead. that the the community knows me as both. It's fine. Um, just to um, again acknowledge and um, and share gratitude for Mrs. Lohman's comments. Um, I I appreciate that perspective. Um, much of it is one that I share, and to that end. Also want to share gratitude to the efforts of administration, the building principals and the teachers on their continued efforts in cultural proficiency and finding themselves to be better advocates and trusted advocates for the students in all of our buildings. And I'm really interested and excited to see where we go from here, knowing that there's still growth and still opportunity for us to build upon the strong foundation that we currently have and uh, again excited for the work excited for the community because i do believe we're moving in a great direction and lastly uh, greatly appreciative for the efforts of the students as well 
in their modes of, of advocating in a way in which that I'm truly shocked, but as mentioned, very grateful. Um, I thought that not having a strong uh, program and for me, from a curricular standpoint, from, from a civics and government standpoint, um, that maybe um, that this particular area of advocacy when it comes to public policy was a place where we wouldn't have an opportunity to have student involvement to this level. And I'm very, very excited that we did. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, there are two, uh, I'm gonna close public comments now because there's no further hands raised. Um, the, uh, there are two more letters in support of Coach Nace that restate um, much of the statements that have been made. And rather than reading them into the record, um, I will ask that they be attached to the minutes so that they will be in the record and available to whoever looks at the minutes. Um, Mr. Roos, is that acceptable? Yes, because everyone will have the same opportunity to read them as they would if they were read aloud now, right now. Perfect. Um, the next item on the agenda is response to prior public questions. I believe that we have had multiple discussions about the MOU that um, have answered questions that may have been left open at the last meeting. And I think that any of those questions are now answered. Um, I see Mr. Cohen, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Can I just request that the uh, names of the individuals that sent the emails in be read into the record? Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Um, Would you like me to do that? I was going to. I, <laughs> I have them. Uh, it, one was Kyle Yeiter, Y-E-I-T-E-R. I'm not sure where in the community he lives. And or Ryan Nace is the second. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so there were no other questions other than ones that may have been posed by police free CSD advocates that we've now, I think, fully addressed. Future meetings are as listed on the next section of the agenda. And that concludes our agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Ms. Move Loman, adjourn. you had your hand raised. I'm sorry, I don't mean to extend the meeting. I really, really don't actually. I, I just feel compelled to say to the people who have been here advocating for Coach Nace, who've been sending us emails, that we have been reading your emails, we are hearing you, but we are not in a position to be able to discuss this as a personnel matter. This was a decision made by the administration and we, we cannot, we can't discuss that. We can't, we can't discuss it with you. We're sorry. We, we hear what you're saying. I have had coaches in my one in particular who I care deeply for and we understand and appreciate your passion, but we, we can't discuss this with you at the moment. And I, I'm sorry, I just felt compelled to say that because we have received so many emails, we've received so many comments, and and I am afraid that the community thinks they're going into like a, a you know hole, that we don't care, that we're not paying attention to them, and that you know we're blowing them off because we don't care about football or something like that. And that's not the case. It's 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 a personnel matter that we're not at liberty to discuss. And we've said that before, but I feel like it bears repeating. It was administrative decision and the board was not involved with it. And I think that the public needs to know that as well. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Um, being no other hands raised by board members, I'll uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. So move, Charles Bill Williams. Second. Second, Julie Haywood. You really want to stay? <laughs> <laughs> all, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.